Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mike. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Welcome to episode three. It's a pleasure, um, pleasure to be here. I'm looking at your channel, though. I don't think you're live on your channel. We're live on mine. Dum, 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 dum. It says that we are live on mine, but there's always a delay. I had this problem last time. And um, so let us know in chat. Are we live on? Yeah, we're live on mine. All right. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're, we're moving in a groove. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, my guest today is Stellium7. Um, I'm sure most of you are going to know Stellium. Um, and if you don't, um, why don't you give everybody a little bit of an intro into who you are and what you do? What makes you tick? Oh, wow. <clears throat> um, let's see. I'm, I've got a YouTube channel. <laughs> My name is Mike, and uh, I um, I work in Spain as a chiropractor. I've done that for the last 15 years. And before chiropractic, I spent a lot of time in and out of uh, IT in different uh, capacities. Um, and about five years ago, I started looking into alternative narratives when it came to things like uh, the nature of our, our realm, our history, archaeology, biology, all sorts of different topics. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's kind of how, how it all began for me. I, I started to make some discoveries that I wanted to share with people and started a YouTube channel about four years ago. I think that's right around the same time we met. I was, yeah. um, we were on the Exertus Discord, the original one before it got yanked. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, I met yeah, you. So there was a... I met you right when uh, Victor and Andreas were in Spain, coincidentally. Oh, right. Yeah, they they were traveling, and um, I saw that Exertus was in Valencia, and I'm like, what? Because <laughs> I'd been following his channel for just a month or so at that point, and I'd seen a few videos, and then I reached out to him privately a few times just to send some some messages back and forth and then at one point i saw that he was in valencia which is just an hour up the road from me and i'm like dude you gotta you gotta come and say hi and uh you know he he wasn't that familiar with my research at that point um and i and i had only made a few videos and yeah so that ended up uh, happening and he came for a second visit uh, at another point so it was it was fun. We had a lot of interesting collaborations, and I got to meet Victor through him and and a lot of great people on Discord who I now consider good friends because we're still in communication. And it's been a it's been a real real <laughs> wealth of knowledge there and collaborations and and uh, yeah, what a blessing that that whole uh, group has been, huh? You know, there's been up and, mm. ups and downs, but you know. You and yeah. a few others, you know, I consider really good friends. And yeah, what an interesting time frame that was for everybody. Um, mm. I remember you were behind the camera recording Victor and, and Andreas in Spain. You know, I, mean, I still remember those videos. Um, yeah, and my fifth Unveiling a Titan video. <clears throat> it's a series with six videos. Yeah. There's a bit of footage there with Victor and, and Andreas as I took him into the eye of Mont Go. Yeah, I remember that part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we give just a little bit of an intro into that series for people that I'm sure most people are familiar, but for the listeners down the road who will be listening to this and don't know who you are, um, I'd say that's probably, you know, your you know, you're most notorious for the Mont Go video on unveiling the Titan. So why don't you just give a little rundown? And yeah, if, if you if want you go to. On to you're more than welcome to show some videos or or some pictures while we get started here just to kind of warm people up on the kind of subject matter we're going to be talking about yeah well i'll i'll, I'll show a little preview um in a moment but i think you know just to do a, a short summary of the origin story there was a there was about four or five different threads that tied together that uh, really caused me to start looking 
differently at, at stones and geology because I'd studied some basics in, in high school and college and never really considered this possibility that um, a lot of the stones that we see might actually be biology originally and not geology. And well, all, all of the stones, uh, except for the, the igneous, the, the volcanic stones that we, we see, we're told are basically formed by creatures dying and laying down over long periods of time and vegetation as well, and then being compressed and, and the more compression, the more heat. And so you go from sedimentary layering to metamorphic layering, and then that goes down to the magma and then gets pushed up via lava. And that I just took for granted as, as what actually happens and tectonic plates and all that sort of thing. So uh, I came across Mud Fossil University's channel. He was talking about these, the idea basically that, that petrification could happen rapidly, but he was calling it mud fossils because he was explaining that different kinds of flesh were being surrounded by mud and that that was causing an exchange of materials that eventually led to things turning to stone. And um, so mud fossil theory combined with a couple of different uh, videos that I saw that were really challenging some of the cornerstones of, of geology. There was one in particular by Wakey Wakey that was called uh, Geology Revived. And that was very interesting because it was showing things like um, a father-son team that, that was um, actually creating coal out of wood. And they were just basically took, in, took a steel pipe filled it with a little bit of a little chunk of wood and a little bit of salt water, capped the ends and then baked it, you know, with heat for a couple of weeks and out came coal. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. So trees lead to coal. <laughs> very, very interesting phenomenon. And then um, in the Wakey Wakey video, I saw uh, another clip from another video of a geologist that was taking a look at, at Mount St. Helens and um, looking at the, the slurry flows that were created by that volcanic eruption and showing that these different things that we called sedimentary layers that the mainstream geological narrative tells us happen over millions of years of time happen in a matter of hours. And, and that, was, that was a mind blow for me because it had the, the detail of the micro layering that, that we're said is, is coming over long periods of time of, of this, of, of you know, the earth laying down. Um, so there was that. And then the, the final kind of, um, th thing that really woke me up to, to what, what I ended up studying here in the, in this, the Costa Blanca region of Spain was a video by J dreamers called petrified Titans. And he was looking at all of these things and he was looking at Roger's work and he was looking at the mythology of the Titans and, and, uh, different aspects of, of rapid petrification. So we've got the mythological stories of, of Medusa and Cthulhu and, and these, these different um, stories that the Greeks told us about, about the Titans and, you know, these great battles between the, the fallen angels and the Titans and, and whatnot. And, um, but I always just took it as fantasy and fairy tale and never gave it any credence. And then uh, watching this video by Jay Dreamers, it really, really kind of, wait a minute, because there, there's a mountain here in the town that I live in that uh, everyone refers to as the elephant. And it looks a whole lot like an elephant from not just one side, but from multiple different angles. And, and I'd been climbing this mountain for already six years or seven years before I got onto this topic and was always puzzling over the different geological formations that, that were on and around and in the mountain, because there are several different caves that I had been in. One of them is, is most prominent um, and share my screen at this point here and uh, show you what I'm talking about. Screen two and then share. So, okay, so we got the infinite share going on there. Okay, so this is this is uh, Google Earth, and and as you can see here, it looks like the mountain is sleeping. This is this mountain here is called Mont Go, and as as we move in closer to it you see that there's a little bit of lag are you seeing that, ben yeah, there's lag and you're breaking up a little bit oh google okay. earth can do that all right just give it a chance to fill in yep yeah there we go we see the eye slow i just mm -hmm. woke it up 
So if you notice now the eye is open and there it's closed. <laughs> Uh, I didn't used to do that, and and it started yeah. doing that after I made a few videos about the mountain, yeah. which is Google a added, fascinating added thing. A little, it's also covered in the fifth. The fifth. Yeah, they, 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 they so you can't really get away. From, yeah, you can't get away with seeing the big picture now without the the eye closing up, which is <laughs> a fascinating feature. But so so this this is just it, it's a cave that's right in the right location, and and. far away you can see that that you're breaking this, up again this even from above it, it's interesting yeah you're you're, you're ghosting on me mike there are these, this is can you hear this me is, am i yeah, yeah i'm, you, I'm not gonna can't. i'll i'll just show you uh, another, yeah, just stick with pictures. Unfortunately, Google instead. Earth is so. Uh, yeah, was it doing that when you were streaming with Mike as well? No. Nope. Let's see. Let me just show you this. It might be because I've got this regressive thing happening here. So let me move this down. I thought it was going to go to a small, small one. There we go. Now you're seeing the mountain in the background, right? Yep. Okay. So let's just take a look here. I don't want to blow anyone's ears out. Tell me how the volume is. And this is just a little 90 second video that I made to um, summarize about a year's worth of research at that point and, and covering the first four videos that I was going to cover in, in 90 seconds. So we can just go through this real quick. Yeah. The Breaking up pretty bad. Can you hear me, Mike? Mike, can you hear me? Oh. The video is completely frozen. Oh, it's going again. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Well, I will just stop it then. Yeah, the music's all is lagged. Yeah, the <laughs> video's not doing so hot right. either. Might have to just stick to pictures. If you can. Sorry, please. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries. Um, I just wonder if it's on your end or if um if it was uh lagging for everyone else as well because everything seemed to be working fine for for me um yeah it's lagging for everyone. yeah so um okay all right mm -hmm. i'm not sure where the bottleneck is but um so yeah basically i started looking at this mountain on google earth and was totally stunned because it didn't just look like look like an elephant from one side it had you know in the first hour i was looking at it there was about 10 or 12 different features that I noticed from, from, you know, looking at Google earth from lots of different angles. And, um, so I decided to get out the anatomy books and go looking online and, and look at the different, uh, structures of the, like, for example, the eye socket, I mentioned I was a chiropractor earlier and I remembered that there were all these different bones that come together in in sutures, which is the, the meeting points of, of the different bones that form the eye socket. And I'd been up at the the eye on a number of occasions and was uh, stunned by the the geology of it. It just didn't make sense to me how something like that could form based on you know the basics of what I knew about about the normal geological explanations. And right. it had a very organic biological look to it. And so when I got out the anatomy books and I started, I, I found some resources online with three D. Uh, anatomy where you could actually get into the eye socket and look at it from different angles. 
And it was just one thing after another that started lining up that, that matched the anatomy. And so right. right off the bat, I'm like, okay, the odds of it looking like an elephant from one angle, pretty good. There's a lot of mountain, mountain, you know, outlines that, that have that kind of an elephant look to them. There's a lot of, um, a lot of different channels, Facebook pages, groups that are showing these creatures that, that, you know, appear to be Titanic beings that are mountains. And I always thought it was cool. I like to, to, to toy with those ideas, but I was also well aware of pareidolia and this, this idea that our brains can, can fool us into thinking something is, is something that it isn't, you know, I can look at knotty pine and, and see faces in the knots, you know, it doesn't mean that there's a face there, but, but, I see the face. And if I took a picture of it and I expanded it, many other people would see the face also, but it doesn't mean it was a face. <laughs> so that's important. You know, this idea of, of pareidolia mm -hmm. and uh, cherry picking is also very important. A lot of people, you know, when they're looking at different things, they, they pick out the, the thing that they want to see, you know? And so I was trying to eliminate that to the best of my ability by looking at the anatomy and, and looking for very specific things. So, uh, the first video I made was just an overview of the whole idea. It's the first video on the channel. It's also the view that the video that's gotten the highest view count. And I would do it a lot differently now than I did then, because there's a whole lot of pictures in there that I wouldn't have included because they're, they're misleading lots of elephant shaped structures that, you know, have lots and lots of layers going up and, and, you know, I'm not suggesting or even believe for a moment that those are elephants that petrified you know, layer by layer going right. down. Of course. Um, so yeah, cherry picking, uh, pareidolia, you've got apophenia, which is the, the, when you recognize a pattern that doesn't really exist, that's, that's another form of pareidolia. It's pareidolia, pattern related pareidolia. And then you've got the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I definitely, uh, could be accused of, of having when it comes to geology and, and, and even things like chemistry and, and, and biology as well, where you learn a, a bit about something and then you think you know a lot about it. And then you run with your, your theories because you're certain of what you, what you thought was correct. And in reality, maybe it's not. So I was aware of all of that stuff going in and I addressed a number of those things from the very first video. And I've done many videos since then talking about these things. And, um, but there's also, a couple of other phenomenon, which are one is one is the preponderance of evidence. When when you start getting a list of things that stack up and match a theory, the the, the larger that list gets, the more the more it becomes possible or plausible or probable as as something that might actually be accurate to to a description of reality. So. Um, you know, I approached it with the scientific method the best I could because I knew right off the bat that it was a pretty far out wacky subject. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I wasn't interested in, in being the, the, the crazy chiropractor who, uh, who thinks the mountain, you know, behind us is a, is a former Titan. <laughs> um, but look at you now. But look at me now. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> So the other, the other thing I mentioned, the preponderance of evidence is, is uh, you know, games of chance. Anyone who's done dice games or, or played cards, they, they're constantly trying to calculate odds in their mind if they're, if they're good at it. You know? yeah. uh, other people are just playing their cards and having fun, but the people who are competing, they have to have a real good understanding of what are the odds of rolling you know, snake eyes once, one in 36. Sorry, I'm right next to the road, so it might get loud once oh, in a while. Oh, it's all but... good. I, I'm used to scooters. <laughs> Everyone should yeah. be used to this. <laughs> Can't do anything about it. Sorry, folks. Yeah. So, you know, roll, roll snake eyes two times. Well, you know, in a game of backgammon, you might do that two times. You're three times in a row. But when you start calculating the odds of it, starting from scratch, and, okay, I'm going to roll three snake eyes in a row. What are the odds of that? Right. And you have to, you have to be able to calculate one times 30, you know, one in 36, and then the second time and. And those numbers very, very quickly become astronomical. Crazy. Absolutely. So uh, Montgo now um, that I, I've been looking at this mountain for the last four years, the, the coincidence list, if you want to call it that, or synchronicity list or correlation list is up to over 50. Mm -hmm. And that's a big number. That's a heck of a lot more than just looking at a mountain from one angle 
with the shadows hitting it just right or the vegetation growing just right. Right. And then and then saying, look, it's the face of a, of a titan or look, it's a gorilla or look, it's a whatever. And uh, so that's what the series is about. It's it's six parts now. There's also a, a live that's under the live tab. A lot of people are not familiar with that, but a lot of some of my best videos were done live in the field where I, I've gone out and, and shown these things. And uh, so uh, the, there's a there's one called. Um, uh, well, it's live from the eye of Montgo. So that could easily be considered a seventh part to the series because there were a lot of additional discoveries that that were made um, about the eye socket. For example, when I was up there with with Andreas and, and Victor, we we discovered, or one of the two of them noticed that that the whole backside of this this section of the the cave that that comes up like a cresting wave, the entire the entire backside of that was covered in a ten inch thick layer of crystal, which is in perfect uh, synchrony with the theories that I have about how different uh, types of, of flesh and bone petrify into different and, things. Uh, yeah, so so you know, in what I've taken to calling biogeology, because I, I think mud fossils was a good term for certain aspects of what we see in the realm, but biogeology is a better blanket term because some of the things are instant petrification, some are happening as a result of paramineralization, which is a slower process where there's an exchange of materials and some you know are happening because they're buried and encased in mud perfect example of that would be um, a bog body for, for example i can show show this as something it's kind of gruesome but um let's see here where am i where to go ah. yeah the bog bodies are very interesting um you know it reminds me of the la brea tar pits and the incredible stuff that they were pulling out of the la brea tar pits um, hmm. things that were yeah that looked like they had just fallen in yeah so here here is a um this is a this is a bog body and and these are formed um when when there's highly acidic water low temperature and a lack of oxygen tans the skin the bones are, are generally not there because of a dissolution of the calcium phosphate in the bone by the peat's acidity so that's interesting, um, but the um, and there was I'm not sure if this has been edited. Things tend to get edited after I talk about them in live streams. Um, but originally, can't find it now. But it 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 said, um, and I think it was here that it said the um, the organs harden. So basically all that's left is the keratin, the skin, the, the, you know, the dermis and, and the hair. And, and then all of this, in my opinion, would, would easily uh, break down to earth, uh, you know, as it starts to erode more and more. But the most interesting point is that the bones dissolve and the organs harden. So that, that's just something I, I found out about in the last couple of weeks. And, and it's something mm -hmm. that would have definitely been a part of what I, I took to calling um, boiled egg theory, because um, in trying to, to understand what I was finding, um, let me just get some examples here. Up. Yeah, the bog stuff is incredibly interesting, and I'm, you might make this point, but I'll make it just in case. Um, it's really important to remember what he just said there about the bones dissolving and the organs hardening, because that's going to be kind of the staple statement for what me and you i think we share many many views and how we can describe a world with all these organs and very few bones and a lot of other anatomy anatomy missing hmm. so sorry i just wanted yeah. to say that but yeah keep going yeah no that's it's it's a great point and the um the bog body thing was was interesting because that's just another potential confirmation of, of the theory that I already had, which I was believing involved massive amounts of heat or like an electric plasmatic event. And, and that we haven't even gotten into it yet, but uh, after doing all this work on the mountain, um, I, I found a stone that, that was uh, phenomenal. It was something that I, I, I asked the, the world, the universe, God to, to provide me with a, 
an example of a mud fossil that was undeniable because I wasn't satisfied with a lot of the stuff I was seeing online. There were a lot of claims being made about things, but a lot of it was nondescript. It was, it was like, you know, it could be any one of a thousand different things, but the person showing it was claiming with absolute certainty that it was a this or it was a that. And right. I, I, fa I found that to be rather frustrating. And um, so let me just pull up here. And, and while you're pulling that up, um, f for the people uh, listening, um, I was, you know, very fortunate enough to meet Mike. I love Mike like a brother and um, I look up to him and I kind of started the journey with him and our friendship right in the process of him um, starting his journey on, you know, this, his channel and um, developing his theories. And, um, you know, he always starts off his talks where he explains, um, you know, w how he approaches things and why it's important to, you know, have kind of a scientific um, basis for your understanding and your explanations. And I think in the YouTube world today, especially when we're dealing with topics like this, it's really, really quite amazing the level of detail and you hold yourself really accountable and your explanations are so thorough that uh, it's really remiss. And people that hear what you're about but don't invest the time into your, your research and what you show um, they're really missing out because I would say it's some of the best stuff on YouTube. And, you know, I throw around a lot of crazy ideas on this channel. You know, if anyone saw the first episode, you know, me and Mike were, Mike, 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 were really throwing out some, you know, pretty outlandish stuff. So that's why I wanted to start with Mike because, you know, we're starting like way up in the air, you know, looking at the world from a really, um, you know, standing back perspective, so to say. And your ideas, I think, are just as monumental, but on a smaller scale. And it's important to, for people to understand um, that, Mike, really, you approached so much of this with such a great anatomy and biological um, background that it really helps the, 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 the newbie, in a sense, get a good grasp of what it is you're saying. And I just wanted to thank you for that because, man, you don't get enough credit for it and it's made a world of difference for me you're just you're just watching your videos has made my anatomy because you know <laughs> i took anatomy in college and and uh, i can't remember any of it but like you make it so much more interesting so i just wanted to to give you that nod thank you yeah it's a huge compliment um yeah i i when i well, going back to this stone that I found, I was walking in a river bottom and I picked it up after sending out this request and I immediately recognized it as a heart. It was four times the size of a human heart. You know, if you hold up your fist, that's that's more or less how big your heart is. And this was, well, I'll show it here. Let me just uh, present, share screen. So this yeah, is Yeah, and the... hopefully before this stream is over, you can show the people a few of your physical collections, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I can, I can run in and get them. And why is this not working? Because <laughs> you guys, he's technical he's difficulties. He's collected some, you know, this happened even if you don't have thing. a good background on anatomy, these rocks are insane. And they're going to, they're going to have you looking down at stones everywhere you go. You know, I took my kids to the beach, um, not long ago after stellium started um you know he'd call me every once in a while while he was out on a walk and i remember one he was in this riverbed and it was just like another one another one another one <laughs> another one it was unbelievable and now yeah. i'm like you know my my oldest son loves collecting rocks and uh we've watched a few of your videos together and it just you know it's just mind-blowing you know I, I wish i could have been nine years old uh, watching videos like yours so Great. Yeah, well, well, geology would have been thrilling to me if I had if I had right? known about the stuff I know now. For um, sure, same here. You know, and it's uh, it, it's it's sad because I think so many things. Like for me, geology was a bunch of old guys digging around in the dirt. <laughs> you know, and it's like they've got these tools, and they're like, it's like two days to dig out, you know, a foot square or something because they don't want to break whatever it is they're 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 trying to pull out of there. And I'm just like, 
No way. That's the that's the most boring thing I can think of. And you know, we're going. Oh to yeah, space, so. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, uh, that's why. Again, so, you know, I I love the newspaper stuff, and you know, I've shared a bunch of, you know, a bunch of what I found that correlates with your stuff. And uh, let me tell you, um, archaeology and geology in the 1800s was unbelievable. You know, like yeah. movies don't even come remotely close to doing the justice to what these archaeologists and biologists were finding. You know, the archaeologists were teaming up with the biologists. And we'll have a few articles where we talk mm. about that. But the things they were finding and, you know, the amount of movie scripts just in this field that we're discussing together that I've found in newspapers is pretty unbelievable. I mean, these articles are so good that you're like, well, this, this, this could be a movie. This could be a movie. Or I find some that are so closely parallel right. to movies. I'm like, man, this is, these script writers are just doing what I'm doing. Maybe look okay. at this picture though. So I think I'm good to go now. So this is the one, this is the rock I was talking about. We'll come back to that other one in a minute, but um, it's uh Th this is this is phenomenal because already from just this one angle, this is exhibiting a whole bunch of very very specific anatomical features. So if I if I put this off to the side here and pull up heart anatomy, and it just disappeared. Sorry, folks, rookie mistakes. It's only letting me open one at a time. Okay, never mind. We'll, we'll do it a different way. So uh, you'll just have to remember what what is going on here. So so this is this is what's known as the left atrium, and this is the left ventricle. These are the two sides of the. There's you know the, we're told the heart is a four chamber pump, which is also not correct. Um, this is this is the coronary artery. There's a sulcus going down here, which is like a little indentation where the coronary artery lays, and then it's very it's very classic that. That this this fatty portion will be here, and I'll, I'll show you. Uh, yeah, I was just about to say that. that looks like a big chunk of fat right there. Yeah, let me see if I can change my settings here, so it lets me open more than one at a time. Here, image preferences. Yeah, and, preferences? and and as we mentioned earlier, you guys, um, different conditions and are going to create different types of stones, because um, you have so many that are so different. It's, it's unbelievable, you know, just a slight yeah. change in, and who knows, temperature, humidity. There's so many things, so many variables that create all these different stones, you know, like, like crystals too. I had everything ready to go. And now I'm now my, um, just my image, like how basic is image viewing software? Like how, how hard can that be? Right. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me share my it's screen. It's all good, again. you know. Okay, we got a lot of great people here yeah. that have yeah. been so so uh, so patient with me as as I learn, and we're kind of learning this together too. So, okay, so let's see if it works now. So if we if we just look at the basics of the heart, this is what I was just showing you. See this fatty portion right here? Are you seeing that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. And so this is the left atrium and this is the left ventricle. This is the thick walled portion. And then this is a thin wall. So when the heart goes into contraction, this which curves outward actually curves inward. And so you get a harp shape. All of this stuff is, is floppy and thin. And, and I theorize that in the petrification process, this and the blood vessels is, is, is basically burning away. And, yeah, and so then you, yeah. then you end up, you end up with this harp shape. But in some cases, the atriums remain, but I've never found any that have the blood vessels remaining because these are thin and they're fatty. Yeah. And so the, um, you know, the thing about the heart is it's very malleable and you can see how just grabbing it here, it's, it's going to bend and this is all going to be burning away. These are the atriums here and here, and they just are like flaps that sit on the heart. And then this is where the openings to the pulmonary artery are. So this is the aorta. It's the biggest blood vessel in the body. This is the vena cava. And the, so they, th those are at the very top. If we look at the, the blood vessels of the heart. Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> I'm sorry, but this is just, a, all right. I, I need to, um, I'm just going to close my image viewing software. 
And how is that possible? Don't get it. Um, I'm going to read an article real quick while you keep fiddling. Go for it. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. looks like you ready. No, you, you, you can read the article. Video. I'm just going to see if uh, okay. I just want to be able to open okay. the multiple gonna, at the same I'm time. I'm going to go through a few real quick. Yeah. And give you some time to organize here. Mm. Petrified Heart found at Sterling, North Dakota, 1926. Petrified Heart of a human of gigantic stature found plowing the land. Also found petrified intestines. Mm. What is said by medical experts to be the petrified heart of a human being of gigantic stature is being exhibited in the city today by E. L. Herr, prominent farmer and breeder of big type Poland China swine who lives near Sterling. Mr. Herr found the unique rock like formation on his farm several years ago, but the curiosity has never before been shown in Bismarck. The petrified heart is as hard as a marble and it weighs two and one quarter pounds. It has an appearance identical to that of a human heart, physicians say, except that it is considerably larger. The veins are easily discernible and the various cavities contained a heart contained in a heart are shown. Even some of the muscles can be clearly seen. Mr. Herr found the curio on the top of the ground following its first plowing. He made a diligent search for other remains of a human body or animal in the vicinity, but found nothing except a small section of what appeared to be intestines. This was also petrified. No bones of any kind could be located. The petrified heart is attracting considerable attention since so far as is known here, nothing of its kind has ever been found. Now that's just one. Um, we'll get into some more. I have dozens and dozens of petrified hearts, petrified animals. Um, yeah, I made a petrified thread of all my posts. One, well, it's actually only not even half of my post, but you guys watching, you could see um, some didn't load, but there's there's Keep there's going. dozens, there's <laughs> dozens and dozens. We'll do one more petrified heart. Yeah. <clears throat> Petrified heartstones. Mr. Suddenberg is the possessor of a very interesting and valuable relic. While digging a well on his place the other day, he found a petrified substance of the shape of a heart at a depth of six yes. feet below the surface. The stone was broken open and was found to be, in fact, a petrified heart. Each valve can easily be traced in the stone. It was entirely encompassed by a dark brown substance, which upon examination was found yes. to be oxide of iron and is the thought to have been formed by the iron in the blood. The heart is about the size of a man's fist, uh, the same as the human heart, or that of a deer. The relic is very interesting and has been examined by a great many people at Ray Hummingston's drugstore, where it is on exhibition. So this is a um, the giant heart stone on the path to St. Michael's Mount. Really interesting. Um, this is a hike in the UK, I believe, correct me in chat if I'm wrong. Um, and there's a rock that's shaped like a heart and it's absolutely huge, it's a boulder. It's a huge boulder behind the sign. <laughs> and, you know, Mike, me and Mike are uh, talking about, you know, gigantic biogeology. You'd have to think that there are some stones that you've perhaps seen in your everyday life that could possibly be hearts and belong to creatures of absolutely monstrous size. So yeah, if you yeah, don't, uh, I think I'm ready to go now. So now I can okay. After now you. I can show some. Um, let's see here. We're present. There we go. Okay. Trala. So here you've got that fatty portion I was just talking about, and and you can see this has been fractured. So this would, if if there wasn't, if it hadn't cleaved here, this would have extended below. So that's that's just a, a, one of many beautiful specimens. Um, that that have come my way from other um, <laughs> wow it's like a major major delay I've never seen this happen before okay so um, and then this line here is what's known as the interventricular sulcus line so um, 
that is when the folds of the heart meet. That's a whole other aspect. But let me just show here. Again, this fatty portion. And, and this is the, the line where that, that sulcus line would be. So that's turned to left and seems to make want me to press. Believable. We're all learning as we go. Something, of course, we're, maybe stuck, we're stuck on the graphic image. Uh, I've got major system interrupts here. So what's going on? Yeah, it, it happens a lot. Every time I show this image, it, something goes wrong, and I end up it ends up being there to gross people out for a whole long, <laughs> for a long time. Um, <laughs> Why don't anyway, you stop what I wanted to, for a sec. Yeah, this is just ridiculous. Do you still have Google Earth open? Because um, even yeah, if it's open, actually, in the background, maybe that's what's doing it. I bet, I bet you it is. Google Earth always gives streams a hard time. You remember Mike? He always had problems until he got his his bananas computer. So, okay, let's just see here. If I start to get, I can't even click on pictures. Let's just talk. How about that? Unreal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're, where we were we were showing this maybe work on bringing up one image, and um, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share one more article here, and kind of give people. Um, you know, from a textual standpoint, what, what they were talking about. Um, this is one of my favorites here. So, um, yeah, so just pull up one image, your favorite image of a heart, or you can grab some physical specimens if you'd like while I'm reading, whatever's easier for you. And, uh, yeah, we'll jump into some of those. So this is one of my favorites. <clears throat> Bones reveal big beast, big as Woolworth building. So here's the Woolworth building. Um, with the Titanic standing next to it. And yeah, just to give you an idea of what this guy's talking about, he finds a petrified body as big as the Woolworth building, close to the size of the Titanic. Bones reveal beast big as Woolworth building. Roy Chapman Andrews reports finding fossil of colossal prehistoric monster in Mongolian desert. Other relics fill 80 cases. Peking, August 16th. The head bones of a prehistoric monster unearthed by Dr. Roy Chapman Andrews at the southern edge of the Gobi Desert, Mongolia today, were described by him as indicating the existence of a colossal animal about the size of the Woolworth building. If the building were in horizontal position, the building is 792 feet high. Dr. Andrews, who is the leader of the 4th Central Asiatic Expedition, said, This was our biggest strike, one of the most interesting finds ever made. This entire area is rich in fossils. We found a monster in the same area in 1925. The saddle-shaped head, headed creature discovered on this expedition to believe, to, is believed perhaps to be the great-grandfather of the 1925 monster had a peculiar nose the head is very broad and had a peculiar feature is that its nose narrows in the middle and gradually broadens towards the nostrils dr andrews said he was more than satisfied with the discoveries he considered his finds sorry it's hard to read sometimes with he considered his finds i don't know with his findings of dinosaur eggs in 1923. The explorer said his discoveries included lots of ball Balacherium fossils and also several several splendid skulls of a new type of nasal horned Titan Nother Nother Lidai. So hopefully you guys can see this if you want to look them up. Quite different from any North American Titan. So, um, but yeah, 792 feet long, prehistoric monster, pretty crazy. And that's, you know, you know, that's only one of hundreds of prehistoric monsters that I've found. I'll do one more here, Mike, and then, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. <clears throat> Pulse of Western Progress, Nebraska, 1894. 120-foot-long dragon found in Utah. 
Circular hole, descended 80 feet, vast underground cavern, grandest sight ever beheld by man, petrified reptile, perfect in every detail, 18-inch curved fangs, only perfect specimen of a dragon in existence. Up in the mountains about five miles west of this town is a curious formation in solid limestone, consisting of a circular hole having a diameter of about three feet and an unknown depth, which has long been regarded as the crater of a prehistoric geyser says the Townsend Montana Messenger. Mr. J.P. Hardy, a well-known mining man, determined to explore it for the purpose of prospecting the rock for mineral. After descending about 80 feet, the passage was found to be blocked by debris washed in from above, which, after clearing away, disclosed the entrance to a vast underground cavern. As soon as he could accustom his sight to the surroundings, Mr. Hardy found himself in the midst of one of the grandest sights ever beheld by the eye of man. On every hand, stately columns caused by the dripping of water through the limestone rose from the floor in graceful form to meet a counterpart descending from the roof. A partial exploration of a few hundred yards brought him to what appeared to be a line of white barrel hoops standing upright and extending away into the darkness further than his one candle could shed its rays. Judge of his astonishment to find an examination that he had discovered the petrified skeleton of an enormous reptile perfect in every detail from head to tail. The bones of the head showed plainly that the monster was well equipped for aggressive warfare. Curved fangs hinged to the upper jaw, 18 inches long, lay in place in what was once a huge mouth, which could easily open four feet. Judging from the articulation, the monster lay in a a nearly straight line, and Mr. Handy found upon pacing it off that that it measured upwards of 120 feet. About 50 feet from the head lay a number of bones that appeared to belong to the skeleton, and Mr. Hardy concluded were the wings. Further examination disclosed the presence of legs, though only one of these was in good condition. Judge Watson, who was read much on prehistoric mammalia and fossils, states that this is probably the only perfect perfect specimen of a dragon in existence. The Smithsonian Institution has been informed of the find, and we expect we'll have a representative here in a few days. Mr. Hardy refused one offer for $20,000 for his find and states that nothing short of $50,000 will purchase it. He has been trying to keep the discovery a secret in order to be prepared for the rush that is sure to follow its announcement. But we are here to write up that the news our readers may look for more disclosures as the cavern is further explored. So one thing... That uh, as this show progresses, that you'll notice is uh, the Smithsonian Institute is called, and you never see another article again. And uh, <laughs> that happens. That happens oh. more than you could ever imagine. Um, so yeah, where where finds go to disappear forever. Exactly. So yeah, thank you for letting me read that. Go ahead. Isn't that where the Ark of the Covenant went? In the end oh of yeah, Raiders I mean, of the Last Ark. I think you're probably a Indiana Jones fan like me. I mean, it was yeah. one of my favorite series as a kid. Uh, obviously, you're a little bit older, but you were at that age where it was like, you know, still very much triggering things in your mind. I'm sure. And uh, I have plenty of articles that f- literally feel like they stole parts of the, the um, Indiana Jones series from them. Um, mm-hmm. I have this one, this explorer um, from from England is. Uh, He's looking for this ancient, um, these ancient, they were called Aztecs, but they actually turned out not to be Aztecs, but they they had built an underground uh, city and he was looking for the entrance for it. And um, all of the people that had, had managed to travel there uh, were killed um, by the, the, the people guarding the, the cave system. And uh, the only reason he was even allowed in was he protected an Indian um, from, I can't remember if it was a, a, a cat, a big cat attack or a snake, but he saved someone's life. And because mm-hmm. he saved someone's life, they, they took him to meet the King and mm-hmm. they had all these sliding doors and there were like trigger rooms where darts would come out and there were like gas chambers. Mm-hmm. Literally they, they could close Straight off of parts the of the cavern and they could gas the chambers. So they'd never been penetrated. So he went into this city I'll have to pull that article up before we finish. But anyways, so that th- those two that I've read just kind of give you a small, small idea. You know, we're talking, you know, and again, we're dealing with your, your Titans, which are much larger, but from a 
from a um, textual standpoint, the 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 900 foot, 700, 800 foot one is about as big as they get, you know, because they're finding them just below the surface, you know, but mm. nothing compares to your type. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think that it's fractals. You know, this this is a three mile long Titan, roughly. Right. And then right. you've got Roger and, and many others who are looking at Google Earth and, and finding things that are, you know, hundreds of miles long even you know a thousand miles long in some cases 13th monkeys mapped out a, a dragon in the in the pacific that looks to be i think it's about 1500 miles long and it looks like a plume serpent it's very detailed you know hard to hard to uh examine that to see if there's any evidence but uh what what i'm not finding with any of those channels uh that are that are showing these kinds of things is is any boots on the ground examination of it and I've mentioned a couple times that I think that the caves are, are key because if you if you see something that looks like a head, there's a famous picture of um, of a uh, let's see. I think I've got things working here a little better. Um, you know, this is. Um, this is in Hawaii, that's that's a, a classic of, of what Oh, am I sharing? I didn't even check. No, not no, sure. Not. Okay. Yeah, it turns out it was Windows Explorer, and the only way I can fix the problem uh, is to do a restart, which would stop the stream. So, I'll, um, I'll I did a workaround, but I, I don't have the same access to my files, so I may not be able to get around as, as quickly as I was hoping. But this will work. Um, so this is a this is an island in Hawaii, and I've seen helicopter footage of this. And as a, as they fly around it from a lot of different angles, it looks like an elephant lying down with the trunk coming out to the side. This is in Iceland. Uh, and I've also seen 4K footage of this where they've gone by it in a boat. And it's all part of the mountain here. This is a side, a side view. And, you know, maybe it's just pareidolia. I don't know, but it, it sure looks a lot like a creature. But it doesn't, it doesn't match, you know, elephant anatomy. When I see things like this, I'm not thinking elephant you know there's there's a lot of stones and 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 mountains that that have an elephant feel to them but it doesn't mean that they're that they're elephants and this is why you've got to you've got to go you know into more detail google earth can be a big help yeah but but uh if you're not actually looking at the anatomy and looking at the histology which is the study of tissue and and comparing what you're seeing on the ground to what you know, you would expect to find, then, then you're just, it, it's point and claim, which I think is what most of the people out there are doing. Uh, there's one channel called Tyson's Mud Fossil Adventures, and he's doing a lot of boots on the ground stuff. And he's talking about creatures that are, you know, basically the size of continents and, um, or, you know, partial continent continents. So it's, it, it's hard to kind of grasp, grasp it and get your head around it. But with Mont Go, there were so many very specific uh, anatomical features that it was it was easy for me to start to to show all the different ways in which it was matching up. And just in the eye socket alone, there's close to I think it's almost 20 different anatomical features just in the just in the eye alone. So and, and they're specific. And in the videos, I show here's the anatomy. And here's what you're seeing, you know, so it's not I'm not just pointing at it and going, see, that's a, that's the interventricular sulcus of the heart or that is, the, you know, I'm not making claims. I'm I'm saying this looks like this. And here's the here's here's how it compares. And that's what we need to see more of. Otherwise, it's just, you know, people um, engaging in flights of fancy. And then if they're making a lot of claims about it, I mean, pareidolia is, is a very real phenomenon. <laughs> this is not an elephant. <laughs> That's not a dragon. That's not a cat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm well, I'm well familiar with pareidolia. And most of the people who criticize my channel, it's a hand wave dismissal. And they, they're not actually, they're not actually reviewing any of the evidence that I presented. That was not an ET tree, you know, and then there's all kinds of stuff with people photoshopping like someone photoshopped this this particular stone to make it look very very much like a hippopotamus someone took this one and then turned it into this 
So we're in this, <laughs> we're in this era of, you know, what is real and you have to do these reverse image searches to see, is this something that's been manipulated or just created by AI because AI is getting better and better at faking stuff. And, and so, you know, is this, is this Sigmund Freud, you know, in a tree? I don't think so. Holding, that's holding the cigar, you know, so you gotta, you gotta exercise discernment. And, uh, and that's what I've trying, I've tried to do from the beginning. So going back to the hearts, um, you know, there's very specific features at the top. You've got the aorta and the vena cava. You've got this, this classic line that goes down. You have another line that goes this way, separating the, the, the ventricle, the atrium from the ventricle. And then if you turn it around on the backside, there's, there's, there's additional, this is the backside. So here's the openings to the pulmonary arteries. So you've also got the blood vessels. You've got this fatty layer. And then we have what's known as the pericardium. If I can find the, um, let's see, desktop. Where are you, desktop? I'm in a totally different program now. And desktop. No. Yeah, so I'll go again, back. I'll making, stick with what was working. <laughs> making the correlation again um, with the little hint you made um, about the bog bodies and mm -hmm. um, how that's so important with finding all these hearts and not a lot of anything else. Now, what's your what's your theory on there being so many more hearts than really just about anything else? Is it there? Is it that there are other organs and they're just harder to spot? Or what do you think? Yeah, the there, there are other organs. They are, um, they're a lot less distinct. And that's the problem. If you look at a kidney, it's, it's shaped like a kidney, but it has this opening for the blood vessels that goes just in and out of, of the side where the indentation is. So if you find a rock that looks like that and you hold it up and you say, this was a kidney, people are going to, you know, wonder what you've been smoking. And, uh, and, and so that, that's the thing is you, the thing about the hearts is there's so much, there's so much different anatomy that you can look at. And even though each species has a slightly different shape, you, you're going to have the same themes reoccurring over and over again. Right. So you can see this one is really covered with a lot of fat and then it's white. This is called the pericardium. It's a fatty sac. So initially when I was finding these stones, I, I was, I was totally puzzled by why, why is this happening? This is just an example of all the different ways it can manifest. You can have, you can have blood red, you can have everything down to bone white. They're, they're doing what's called decellularization where they're actually growing hearts in a matrix and then they're introducing the blood after the fact. So the, the, the heart is primarily fatty tissue and what's giving it its color is not so much the heart muscle but the blood itself that's in the heart. So when they introduce the heart, I would show a video of that, but nothing seems to be working <laughs> tech wise. But, um, you know, when they're showing that, um, you can see it go from bone white to blood red in, in a, literally a matter of seconds. So there are all of these different features that a heart has. And going back to the mathematics and, and you know, probability, if you find a rock that's got a, a, you know, 12 of these features, that's extremely unusual. And if you can go out in the space of minutes, find several rocks that match the, you know, the, what, I, what I'm calling the harp shape. And then right. oftentimes they'll have the, the indentation on, the, on the, uh, the top. So the top will either have holes or an indentation or a crease because I showed you before that the heart is malleable. So, so it pin, if there's any pressure on the heart, it's going to pinch off that opening. And so you're going to get a little line. And sometimes it's just a dis discoloration because it's worn so much. The hearts take on so many different shapes. This is a giraffe heart. This is a this is an elephant heart. This is the heart of a cow. But it's the same theme over and over again. Yeah. And and as far as these lines that I'm talking about, this is this is the heart has been in in this photograph. It's just been unraveled and then ravel and then uh, rolled back up. And and so this portion here meets this portion. These are different heart fibers, and these are different from these. And so those create what are known as sulcus lines. And that's very specific and they're in very specific places. Yeah. So if you find a heart that, you know, a heart shaped stone that, that looks like a heart uh, and, it, and it's got a heart shape and maybe it's got some blood vessels in the right place. And then it's got openings like in this one, I showed you this part here. This right. is the backside. 
So mm -hmm. on the back side towards the top, I would expect to find the aorta and the vena cava. And guess what? There it is, <laughs> right? So this, this is from the, the first video I made on the subject called Mud Fossils, the Heart of the Matter. And since then, I've made many, many more videos. And like you said, I've gone out in the field and I've, I've found these live. I've found so many examples of them in all sizes from, from millimeters up to, you know, a meter in, in size. And they're exhibiting this, these features over and over again. This list on that particular rock is up over 20 now. And I've gone in with an endoscopic camera into these holes and there are chambers inside. And the right. chambers have the features that, that you would expect to find in a heart. And a lot of the hearts that I find in this area are, are very, um, they're very white. And they're, I have different theories about that. Coming back to your question about why, why would the hearts be found outside the body? Initially, I wasn't so worried about that. This is an example of, I think this might be a video. Yeah. And before we get too far, yeah, I wanted to say something about mm -hmm. the harp and the heart mm. and the pulling at someone's heart strings and yes. the obvious correlation between the two's shape. Have you ever looked into that more? Because um, you mentioned it before, but yeah, uh, it's, I think it's, there's, there's a purposefulness to that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this book and chance is mine. Yeah, I, I, um, you know, you've got an anagram of heart as well. That's another right. important bit. Uh, so my virus protection now has popped up. The computer gods don't like me today. And we've talked um, so, about, um, yeah, so we'll, I'm sure we'll get I, into I think that there's definitely a little bit to the harp. I'm sure we'll get into mining a little bit and yeah, um, can expand on the that phrase, just... the heart of gold, you know, and how the human heart contains gold and, um, that certain, um, certain giants, certain petrified giants have been found that have been turned to different types of ore and yeah we've talked you've mentioned we haven't talked about it yet but you've mentioned all the correlations between mining and their terminology their lingo so to say and how it's obviously a biogeological reference wouldn't you say I think so. Yeah, I think that the truth is often hidden in plain sight. And when it comes to, you know, we've got the expression, the heart of Africa as well. And if you look at Africa, it's the same, it's the same shape. Um, so now, now that this software is working a little better, I can just show there's so many examples of this that I found out in the field. These are the pulmonary artery openings. And this is the, the isthmus, which is, which is basically where that the two, uh, the two openings are, and then this is the backside of that same stone, and it's got the aorta right where it should be, and then right, yeah. this is the this is the sulcus line. That's a foot yep. and a half. I have that I have that here in my office. Um, How was the hike back with that one? <laughs> it wasn't fun, I can tell you, because it's really hard to lift. These are just small ones, you know, on a plate, and some of these I wouldn't show necessarily now because they're they're less distinct. But I I you know over. Over time, they would call it cherry picking, but I've just refined my ability to spot these things. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm finding more and more examples of them. And some of them are very big. And you can see here, you know, the, the openings are right where they should be. So the, I, I mentioned before that on contraction, the heart tapers in, but it also twists. And when it twists, it, it um, a lot of my, I can't find the desktop on, in, in this software that I'm using now, which is a drag because some of my best examples are on the desk, um, desktop, but, um, the, um, here we go. Hatch flow, fleshy hearts, septum, just show some other things. This is what I was showing before the septum, which is the opening. And then you have this, this space between. So I found several hearts, heart stones that have that, that septum as well. And, um, and then, you know, you, I mean, it's just how, how often can this repeat? You can see this little one here right at the top where you would expect it. So there's a tapering in. And what I was going to mention and show is that not only does the heart taper in on the sides, like you can see in, in all of these stones, but if you look at them from the bottom, there's a twisting because the heart is, a, is, is 
um, it's not pumping blood out to the body. It's actually working through a vortexing. And, right. and as the really heart important. goes in, yeah, this is, I, I've got a video on my channel called, it's just a one minute video. It's called the heart is not what you think. And it's probably, if you sort by order, it's like four or five videos ago. And it's just a one minute summary of the works of, of um, the great cardiologist, Francisco Torrent Guasp who was the discoverer of the myocardial ventricular band. Uh, these are big, big, big words, but the basic idea is that um, the, the heart, uh, if, if you see here, this is actually him um, dissecting one. Here's the aorta and the vena cava. And, and this has been boiled and then the outer fat has been removed. And he was the one who discovered that the heart is not a four chamber pump like they were we were taught in school. It's actually, no way. Now this software isn't working. There we go. All right. It's actually a rope. And, and what, what, the, what I mean by that is that this opens up into one long band. And this, this is key to understanding how the heart actually functions. And this ties into the works of, of somebody like um, Victor Schauberger and his understandings of water flow and how everything is vortexing. Yeah. His, nature. his drawings of the heart um the the actual um his concepts of the vortexing i'm sure people have seen his sketches they're all over the internet but yeah um yeah i might i his, might have some here if I can his his them. sketch of the heart from an energetic standpoint you know it being kind of a magnetic field of its own which it is that's proven but uh, you know the the flow and the yeah world. i mean if you just look at the way electricity flows <laughs> You know, you can see here with the with the Tesla stuff the, that this is it's exactly how our blood vessels form. There's I can't remember who who did these sketches, but I'm getting closer to the. Oh, the, they're beautiful. Um, it reminds me of the labyrinth, you know. This is looking at the heart from the bottom and you can see the, the, the vortexual. So there's two opposite rotating spiraling vortexes. And and when you when you look at how the heart flows, you're really looking it's something like this when you're looking at the blood flow through the heart. Yeah, the toroid. Yeah. So the heart is a is is just the most amazing and fascinating thing. This is this is Francisco Torrent Guasp. This is him doing the dissections. And I thought I had um, the pictures of. Um, if you want to see a documentary about his life, this is this is a great one. I've got a video called Petrified. Uh, uh, what is it? Petrified organs. Um, something in synchronicities and it's all about victor schauberger and and guasp and his discoveries so here's here's some of the the this is a one that was sent to me by a subscriber it's absolutely beautiful this is the front side this is the back side so now that you've you know seen enough of the anatomy you can start to recognize that this is is probably not pareidolia there's a lot more going on there's a a, a lot of examples that have been sent to me and, um, you know, some of them are extremely fleshy red, like this one. And they have the openings in the right places. So it, oh, here, here's the Schauberger image that we were yeah. talking about before. Mm -hmm. So this is how things grow, right? All trees grow in this fashion. You've got this spiral. This is exactly what the bottom of the heart looks like. Heart is functioning as a, as a dual opposite rotating spiraling vortex. And, and it's just absolutely incredible when you understand the implications of that because that's exactly how you know magnets function as well if we're looking at magnetic flow you know this would be well, that's a video so i want to risk video right now with all the challenges i'm having um electric yeah it's quite amazing really when you understand the vortex and how how it actually is you know almost a, an energy generator you know, of its own. Um, it yeah, there's like a, it's like a singularity right in the very center of it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And and so this is this is what a toroid looks like. And when you look at magnets, you know, you're looking you're looking at the same thing. Uh, here we go. This is a ring magnet from above viewed on a ferro cell. And and so basically, you're you're looking at a at a, a rotating vortex 
And, and this is what we're talking about when we're looking at the heart. <laughs> it's the heart is so more fantastic than, than we were ever taught. I, I have a friend who's a cardiologist. He wasn't taught about any of this in school, even though uh, Francisco Torrent Guas made his discoveries in 72. It took him 25 years before he finally started to receive recognition for, for what monumental discoveries he, he, you know, he made. And unfortunately, you don't win the Nobel Prize. Uh, you can't win the Nobel Prize when you're dead. So, so you know, this is, this is how life functions. And we see it in everything. We see it in the, you know, the way in which water functions, the way in which things grow, uh, you know, fulgurites, this, this fractal pattern of, of blood vessels. It's just so incredibly fascinating uh, when you get into it. And uh, that's why I've devoted so much of my time to making videos to share this with people, because I think that if we knew more about geology, um, you know, and, and anatomy and, and from, from a perspective that, that more closely matches reality, you know, we our kids would be incredibly fascinated and, and they would just, they would love to know more about this. Um, so this Absolutely. is this is getting back to some of the things I was trying to show before when everything started glitching. You know, here we're looking at the eye socket. It's very, very specific. You have these different colored bones and, and these lines where those bones meet are sutures. And then you have what are known as fissures, which are openings here. And so in the second and the fifth Unveiling a Titan videos, I show video footage of us going into these fissures and I show that they're in the eye socket of Mont Go. They're exactly where they should be. And not only that, but but right in here, cresting up in the middle of the cave is the remains of the eyeball as well. Right. And as I said before, the whole backside is is um, covered with this this quartz layer, which I've theorized that all things that are fat in the body will petrify into quartz. So you've got you've got ligament, tendon, uh, nerve brain, disc, uh, and, and blood plasma as well. Cause, cause you know, 55% of, of the volume of blood is plasma and that's primarily long chain fatty acids. They're lipids that, that are fat. And so all of those different things in, in, you know, the right conditions are going to petrify to, to quartz. And that gets right. back to another really, question. Yeah, really yeah. important, uh, statement right there. Really important. The quartz and all the different um, types of quartz are so very much related to a biological um, prior existence. Wouldn't you say, for the for the the majority yeah. of it? Yeah, yeah, and it's not just uh, biological in, in the sense of creatures. It's right. also trees. in mm. trees as well, because exactly. all the different ways in which sap manifests also petrified to different kinds of quartz, and it's going to be everything from you know bone white to to blood red. I mean, if you go into some of the trees. Um, you know, the different ways in which trees grow. Um, I showed this in my live stream the other day. This is a, a, a I think it's called the dragon tree and it's got this blood red sap. So, you know, what's that going to look like when it petrifies? <laughs> it's going to, it's going to look like something that was bloody probably. Yeah, you know, right? something Here else you can that's see. interesting. Um, when I was in Mexico, uh, one of the times I was there, I went and saw the oldest cactus in Mexico. Um, and it bleeds red mm -hmm. as well. How interesting is that? Yeah, very interesting. So again, these are the fissures I was talking about. This picture is very fascinating because in the cave of Mont Go, when you come in, it goes back and then there's a, there's a 45 degree angled drop going back down. And in the fifth video, we, we go down this narrow, narrow passage that's, you know, big enough for, for your body and not a whole lot more. And then we we go down and it opens up into a cavern right here. I mean, so, you know, this is where it gets back to odds. How many coincidences have to line up before you start having to consider that, hey, maybe there's something to this. You know, the, this is a this is a screenshot on Google Earth. I have a better picture elsewhere, but I can't find it right now. Um, but there's there's an opening here. It's a cave that goes this way. And if you look here. This is where the infraorbital foramen is in all vertebrates, not, not, in, not just in an elephant. So it may not be an elephant. I've said that many times, but this is, this is looking through that from one side to the other. 
This is yeah. from further out. So, wow. so this where you're seeing light here, this behind this structure, that's all broken away. All and right. You can see that here. This is all broken away. So here it continues, and and you have the cave, and then here I was standing, I was standing over here looking this way, seeing the light here. Right. But this is this is looking through. So that would normally be closed, and you wouldn't see light, and it would continue, and it continues to the other end, which looks like that. And mm -hmm. so when you start to get up close and you look at it, you're you're looking at something that looks very very biological, not not geological, not something that formed by the laying down of layers. Right. And if, and if we look further at a, at a skull, and again, it may not be an elephant, it might be a pachyderm, it might be some other creature. Um, this is not the eye socket here. This is the temporalis fossa where the, the temporalis muscle, which is one of the chewing muscles is. So the muscle would come down and it would attach here. And then you have the masseter, which is the main chewing muscle. And this section here would, is broken away on Mont Go. But, but if you look here, this is one of the suture lines of, of, of an elephant skull. And here you have right in that exact place, and it even jogs in the same fashion, you have this line where there's an overlap of those of what I believe are the two bones of the inner socket. Here you can, yeah. see, it even, here you can see it even better. So, I mean, how many coincidences does it take before you have to start to consider, like, is there a possibility that this might actually be a thing? right where you would expect the optic fissure to be, there's a big crack in the cave right there. And there's there it's going down. So that's where we crawled in. And, and so to the left over here is where the, here's a better picture, shows them side by side. So this is an elephant skull. This is the optic fissure. What are the odds? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Wow. Incredibly um, similar. Yeah. So, you know, people, people might say, oh, you're just cherry picking. And, and it's like, oh, okay. Or I'm showing correlations and um this is this is the 10 inch thick layer of of crystal that i was talking about i don't have my best pictures in this folder on this let me see if i can here we go so uh here's the cresting portion that sticks up that i was talking about right and inside the from the front there are channels going in that are like blood vessels mm -hmm. and those channels break off into smaller and sp smaller channels just like blood vessels would so, you know, it's just like after a while, you, you, you just you left shaking your head um, because there's just so many things that are lying up. So either reality is morphing to match my investigation of it or this is a real phenomenon that that. Uh, so this is the backside of it. And look at the structure. Now, if you look at the structure of an eyeball, you have the sclera. Right. This mm -hmm. fat. But but it's not just the sclera and then the nerve. You have the attachments of the of the muscles themselves, and then if you were to pull that out, this is what the backside of an eyeball really looks like. And now, if we petrified that to quartz, and it's not such a reach because it almost looks like quartz to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about this, <laughs> right? If all of this were to petrify to quartz, guess what it's going to look like if the the, the the front has blown out in the petrification process and left you with a cresting wave that sticks up the whole back side of that should be covered in quartz mm -hmm. and that's exactly horizontal the first vertical growth which you see pretty clearly there yeah 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 so and and so it's just another one of those hmm that's that's suspicious don't you think kind of things you know so for people who are like, this is just batshit crazy, it's important to remember that, you know, mainstream geology tells us that things petrify, you know, <laughs> petrified wood, but they give us timelines of hundreds of millions of years. Here's a petrified pine cone and look at all the detail that, that you know, is, is found in that. This is Auracaria mirabilis. They, they still grow. These trees get to be very, very tall. And so the, the theory is that they were covered in lava flow and ash and then there was a paramineralization that occurred um, that led to it oh and that gets back to your question before about the hearts is is how how are the hearts going to be found back to this gruesome picture outside of the body right so you have the lungs and i don't find lungs and i think that's because lungs are very porous they're designed to hold air and they expand in in a in a far different way than than hearts do but both of these are contained in this in this sac here, which is pleura. 
And, and pleura is, is just the name for this big, thick, fatty layer that holds all the organs and the liquids in. Then the heart itself is contained in its own fatty sac. It has the thickest of the fatty sacs in the body. It's known as the pericardium. So isn't it interesting that this first rock that I found that got me on this subject in the first place is, is, is white, except where everything is, is, has started to break or wear away, and then it's blood red. And if I put it under water, it really comes to life. Yeah. So fascia I've, is, I've seen you do it. Yeah, and fascia is found throughout all of the different um, parts of the body. If you look at muscle, for example, it's not just surrounding the outer layer of the muscle. It goes in and it's microscopic. So fascia is the, the very likely the real neural matrix of the body, in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of experimentation that's being done showing that it, it appears to be a communication network as well. You know, so we have our nervous system and our nerves. Yeah, but, very fiber optic -y. Yeah, for sure. it's totally like the mycelial network of the mushroom as well. Definitely. So, you know, it's as above, so below, but it's also as within, so without. And, um, you know, so getting back to uh, these heart stones, you know, I, I can show I have hundreds of examples of these. And I've been refining the ability to see them. And the ones that, that I have now are just showing so much anatomy. And, uh, you know, so if you go to the, you know, an initial uh videos that i show but here's here's three in a row these are about a foot long and you can see right there that's another rock that's embedded in there i had to pry yep. that out and here as well i wish i'd save these two because they they're fascinating but this one it's got the the isthmus i talked about before and on the back side it's got a big aortal opening right where it should be and then at the bottom here which is fractured and cleaved off this would have been curved like this like the others you can see the opening to, to the ventricle. So that, you know, that's just a huge number of uh, anatomical correlations. There, there you can see it better. There's your ventricle opening. The, the ventricle being the, 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 one of the biggest chambers in the heart. Um, yeah, so now I've been talking, talking everybody's ear off for a while. <laughs> you know, um, I'm gonna... some of them show blood vessels as well. I'm going to read an article that's going to kind of kick us into the next little um, segment, I suppose, mm -hmm. that I want to get into. And that's discussing giant trees, um, mining, and their correlation, if that's okay. Absolutely. Hold so, on, yeah. I think. I just, before you do that, let me just show this rock here. Oh, please. Look at that. Can you see that video? Is it lagging or is it nice? No, it's lagging a little, but I can see it. Yep, you can see the the redness yeah. of iron. Yeah, so it's that kind of a that one scene. had the openings at the top, and I just smashed it against other rocks, and you can see that it's basically like blood inside. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, it just goes on and on the the number of correlations that match up. But um, go ahead with what you were what you were gonna read. Yeah. So you've seen this one before but it's gonna it's a good little segment into the, the next thing we're going to discuss <clears throat> uh, nevada petrifactions and fossils nevada 1869 it is not a little whimsical to notice that since that little 10 foot stone man was dug up at cardiff which is creating such a sensation among the new york yankees there are plenty more suddenly resurrected down in Arizona and in various other parts of the country, compared with which the Cardiff giant is a mere Tom Thumb. Over in Calaveras County, California, huge petrified... I apologize, my dog keeps chewing on a rock. That's annoying. <laughs> and now an airplane. Come on. Really? Go, go to sleep. <sighs> My apologies, where was I? Over in Calaveras County, California, huge petrified skeletons of men are said to be quite common. Also, the bones of yet huger animals on which they used to ride, judging from the saddles as large as dump carts, found still strapped on their backs. We helped to dig up a thigh bone ourselves over there, 15 feet long, which doubtless belonged to some antediluvian chief. Some called it an odd log, an old log, 
but it was the shape of a thigh bone anyhow, and badly petrified. We have never known many complete stone giants to be exhumed in this vicinity, but out in Humboldt County, one large body, over a hundred feet long, known as the Little Giant, has been found completely petrified into quartz and silver ore. It is well known. It is well known to us all that petrified horses are plenty in Comstock Ledge. Some of them are over 50 feet high. Also, numerous huge spurs, which none but monstrous men could appropriately wear. No human bones except bones of contention have yet been found in the Comstock, but some of these are of great size, especially those found a few years ago. Petrified wild cats are still found throughout the mining region. We have plenty of big feeling men among us, but none of extraordinary size to petrify. Although many of them are already old fossils or fast becoming so. That just goes on to describe the people that they're working with. But the part that I really wanted to focus on was absolutely gigantic men in California. So um, those of you familiar with the gold rush and the hydraulic style of mining that was very much made famous in California where they were using high pressured water to blast away entire mountainsides. Um, so yeah, they find a hundred tall, hundred foot tall petrified giant, a 50 foot tall petrified horse, um, saddle still on the backs of some of the petrified horses, um, as big as dump carts. And the important part of the, although this is a whole, um, excerpt is incredible. Um, the part I was wanting to transition through was known as the little giant has been found completely petrified into quartz and silver ore. Um, this is something me and you have talked about for a long time over the years, Mike. And yeah, so let's uh, transition into your opinions on uh, mining and mining's relation to mining biogeological forms um, and how trees fit into that whole situation as well. Yeah, it's just, it's incredible. And that, you know, the quartz, aspect of it as well is um you know another thing that um it's it's not uncommon to find things that are petrified uh that are quartz and um so there are some out there who've criticized this idea and they're like show me the chemistry show me how how that can possibly work and you know and uh you know some things are self-evident you don't actually have to uh, be able to explain the chemistry or the mechanism behind how something exists if it exists and it's there before your eyes. The empirical evidence trumps any model about how that evidence came about. And, um, you know, it's it's like, show me the model, show me your model. It's like, well, you know, if, if there's a group of people, oh, wow, red cap, <laughs> red cap, Goblin, thank you very much for a very generous donation. He's showing you the love. That's two days in a row. Yeah, him. much, much appreciated. Um, you know, if there's a group of people and there, someone points over and they say, hey, look at that elephant over there. You know, everyone can look. If there's an elephant there, they're going to agree. Wow, what a cool elephant, you know. But who's going to be like, how do we know that's an elephant? You know, show me a DNA test. You know, I want I want to see a scientific experiment verifying that that's an elephant. It's like that's that's what people are doing with this. You know, when I'm showing all these heart stones, the official the official model when it comes to heart stones, or I mean, when it comes to these stones, is that they're what are known as polycalcitic conglomerate cobbles. Poly meaning many, calcitic meaning many many bits of many different kinds of calcite. Polycalcitic. Conglomerate just means it's a mishmash of a bunch of different kinds of elements or stone, right? Right. And cobblestone is just the word we use to describe stones that are shaped like this. Like you can go into the old world cities and those are those are cobblestone roads in the cities. So basically they're saying, and, and, you know, I, I sent a bunch of these off to a laboratory and uh, I, there's a video that I made called Paradigm Crushed um, that, that uh, chronicles all of the communications that I had with the people before, during, and after um, the examination of these stones and their findings, quote mm. unquote, yeah. and uh, and and that is an incredible um, educational tool for anyone curious about what would happen when somebody like me, who makes a discovery that is pretty fascinating and, and seems to have some merit, runs up against the mainstream 
you know, academic perspective and how, how is it treated when it doesn't match the prevailing paradigm. And so that's why I called it paradigm crushed. So, um, but they're basically just saying that, that these are different lumps of clay that found themselves in sedimentary layers and then were compressed over time. And that compression led them to be uh, on the, on the verge of being a metamorphic rock, you know, like you think of marble or granite or one of these really hard stones that looks like a whole mishmash of a lot of different things. That's your metamorphic rock. And they're saying that, that these were compressed in sedimentary layers and they're on their way to becoming that, but haven't become that yet. And then because of tectonic activity and the breaking of these layers, they end up popping out and then water, wind and, and river erosion finishes off the process of curving off the, the edges and, and then boom, you end up with this heart stone that's got 25 different features matching heart anatomy. Right. <laughs> so they're saying it's all pareidolia and that there's no actual evidence for anything I'm, I'm showing and that it's cherry picking and that it's the Dunning-Kruger effect that I think I know things about geology and I really don't know anything. And, you know, so, you know, I, as, as, um, as challenging as this stream has been because of, uh, my, my tech, you know, I, I've shown a, a lot of, uh, of evidence already in support of this theory. Um, Definitely. I was, I was going to show, you know, getting back to your question before. So I, uh, share the, the screen again. Um, let's see here. Oh, I am sharing. So oh, there we go. And, and you had another donation, by there the way, I, I put it up on the screen for you. I missed it. Oh, dovetail. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd, um, I, I did set up a coffee me or Kofi or something account a long time ago, but it never got used by anybody. I, I, I'm not sure what my, I think, I think the, the account name is Stellium seven. If, um, that I think I am able to keep more of that. Cause yeah, doesn't YouTube take like 30% greedy buggers? Yeah. I um, idea. probably 33% actually, I would guess <laughs> anyway. So, so, I was I was finding these stones in in large numbers and and I didn't understand how it could be because initially I was thinking it was it was mud fossil theory you know but that didn't make any sense because if if the body was encased in mud and all of that mud slowly over time started to work its way into the stones and the gas and the and the liquid in the in the tissues worked its way out why wouldn't the head and the and the the arms and legs and the rest of the bodies be there and uh, we can get back to the bog bodies in a moment because I think that's also uh, part of the explanation. But the basic idea that I came up with was the outer portion of the body must be being destroyed in some fashion. And, and when that happens, um, let's see, if we go back to this, this one again. I talked about the, um, this gruesome picture again. So if you imagine a volcanic flow with 1500 degrees temperatures and, and, uh, you know, wins the, the speed of sound, how is that going to affect the outer portions of the body? It's just going to absolutely annihilate it. And, and as that annihilation is, is happening, the liquid that's in this chamber is going to boil like a pressure cooker, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this heart is, is, it's covered in a big, thick fatty layer, and it's the thickest of the fatty layers. So that goes back to why I think the hearts are so prevalent. I think a lot of the other organs don't have the same protection that the heart has. And so they're they're being destroyed more easily than the heart is. Well, if you think about going back to the, the egg I showed a second ago, where'd it go? Eh. Um, you know, you put a, you put a hard boiled egg, or, I mean, you put an egg into water and within 10 minutes, you're going to have a hard boiled egg. It goes from liquid to, to harder and harder, you know, and then after 12 minutes, you probably don't want to eat the thing because it's not going to be so tasty. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you, if you keep going with that and you increase the, the temperature by, I don't know, a couple few hundred degrees maybe, and you add a whole bunch of pressure and you have this outer sac that is the pleura, and then you have the sac of the heart, is it possible that that could harden to stone? I believe so. Cause that's what I'm finding Yeah. as, as the rest of the body is being destroyed. So, you know, whereas like a heart like this, it's got a very thin layer, so it might not be preserved so well, right? But, but some of those, they're just, they're really thick, <laughs> you know? And, and so this is all going to get burned away 
this stuff, this floppy stuff sitting off, off of the top. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of the, the idea is of behind the boiled egg theory. Here's another example of a very thick part of pericardium is that the pericardium, which is fat, is going to crystallize to quartz. Meanwhile, the proteins, which are the heart muscle and you know the fascial matrix that is the heart is going to uh, is, is, is also going to, to harden. So, you know, first came the empirical evidence and along the way, I've been trying to come up with theories to explain it. And I don't have the, the chemistry to, to be able to work on it, but Lenny time who I saw was in the chat in, in the chat earlier, shout out to Lenny. He's, he's got a PhD in, in molecular chemistry and we've been talking about these and working on, on some more comprehensive theories about how this takes place. That has to do with cold fusion and and, and different uh, ideas about you know how one element can change to another. In the mainstream model, they tell us that one element changes to another when you have um, when you've got uh, enough heat from suns. You know, it's like the the compression that happens inside of the heart of a star is going to take the helium and the hydrogen atoms, and it's going to push them together so much that eventually they create these other elements that, 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 you know, make up our periodic table. And then we can do other ones probably, you know, with different kinds of experimentations, fusion experimentations in laboratories, and maybe they exist for a certain amount of time and, and then they dissolve or, you know, those are, those are theories that may have merit to them, but you also have to consider biological transmutation, which is the idea that, that our bodies are creating elements. And I've talked about this a bunch of times already where a chicken is creating calcium because the chicken is eating mica and different things in the seed. And every single day it's pumping out an egg. Well, they've measured the amount of calcium in the chicken's diet and the amount of calcium that's in the eggshell that the chicken is pumping out. <clears throat> and it's way more calcium than the, than the chicken is ingesting. So yeah, there and, you have... And you, you sorry to cut you off but you said this yesterday and i you i think it's so incredibly magical and beautiful this statement um because it always it always made me think of this silly um um statement that you've heard through all your childhood i'm sure many of our listeners have heard what came first the chicken or the egg well <laughs> when you extrapolate that from just what you said there we can kind of take it to another um you know to another level and think well, essentially, this is kind of that hidden alchemical process, you know, that essentially the chicken is transmuting hmm. other minerals. And that kind of like for me is kind of poetic to the human soul. And what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, it's like the Taurus, right? <laughs> and we all just kind of came spiraling out of it, you know, because how, how can a chicken transmute? other minerals and create calcium because I had a, I had a farm and uh, I lived on it for 10 years and we knew each other when I was still on the farm and I had, uh, you know, almost 50 chickens at one point. And, uh, that's a lot. They're of incredible animals, you know, <laughs> they're incredible, yeah. incredible animals. And the egg thing, I never even thought about that, but like that statement just, you know, I think it's so powerful and it just, when you said it, it made me think, you know, I extrapolated, you know, that whole spiraling with one idea into this magical world we live in and how that's really what's happening, right? Transmutation. And, the, and they want us to think that the, the dinosaurs morphed into chickens. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. Yeah, that's, in the newspapers, you know, which, you know, again, it's my specialty and kind of my niche, but it shows nothing even remotely close to that. <clears throat> hmm. They had giant chickens, They, you know. They were finding giants. They had giant everything. That's the thing. Is like exactly. my people. People hand wave dismiss my theories about Mont Go, and and yet we have gigantism in in the in the mainstream geological model also. And they tell us that all you know this mega flora and mega fauna all existed, and that we used to have dragonflies that were I don't know 30, 30 centimeters to a meter in in size. Well, if a dragonfly can be that big, how big would the human have been? How big would the elephant have been? How big would the tree have been? Right. And is there evidence, we, you know, we'll, we'll get into the trees in, in a minute, but I just want to finish um, real quick um, yeah, please. this point that I was making about, let's see, I've got a remove button, but I want to go back to, uh, here we go. There we go, there. 
So, you know, again, so up here is the heart and the lungs. Here is the abdominal cavity. So intestines, I think, is an interesting thing because if you have a creature that's eaten a lot of different kinds of things and intestines petrify, then you're going to get your aggregate rock. You're going to get your conglomerate mix of all kinds of different things because that's what the intestines are. It's just a mix of so many things. So when you see these, you know, you have this beautiful uniform rock that makes sense. And then there's like some other layer of just like, mishmash, whatever, how did that happen? Maybe you're looking at petrified intestinal remains. It's, uh, it's just a, a thought. The other thing is that we have kidney stones. We can have gallstones. We can have uh, bladder stones, right? All of, these, right? all of these different kinds of stones are produced by the body. I'll show some pictures of those real quick because that's, that's fascinating in and of itself. If we go to um, biogeology and we go to geodes and opals, Oh, by the way, anyone who thinks, you know, brains can't petrify, there's a petrified brain. That's a whale brain. Mm -hmm. Guess what it turned into? Quartz. Yep. I don't have to tell you how to tell you that is a petrified brain. It is self-evident. There's a whale brain. There's a killer, you know, I mean. I have um, a few you know, articles. There's another. On petrified brains. In fact, they had a skull with the brain still inside of it and it, they, they said it was all completely quartz and this is in the mid 1800s yeah so i mean look at this you can see portion a portion of this is broken off and internally what is it done it's turned to quartz crystals <laughs> now quartz i've got lots of examples i'm not going to go looking for them right now but quartz also will vitrify you know we we can take sand and we can make glass out of it right it flows like a fluid and then when it cools right. and hardens you can mm -hmm. see through it it's so exactly clear. Right. So vitrification is an incredibly important aspect of all of this as well. Well, this is somewhere between, um, you know, just turning to quartz and then you've got actual, you know, crystal growth here, it looks. And maybe that happened after the fact because crystals do grow, you know. But then this is what uh, many consider to be vitrified brain in the scientific community. There are very few examples of this, they say. But this may be why I find so few brains is they might just melt away literally in the cataclysm. So the yeah. heart and, and other stones that are already in the body may turn, uh, you know, they, they're, they're hardened enough to be preserved. Whereas the rest of the body, going back to the bog body that we started with, you know, the rest of the body might actually be um, just turning into earth and mud, you know? So there's, there's so many different examples of geodes that look very biological when you start to get into it. And, you know, when you look at, at the, at, at like, for example, here, this is a single gallbladder. Look at all the gallstones in this one gallbladder. Sheesh, you wouldn't want that, right? But yes. they have surgery to remove these stones. Well, if you slice these stones in half, guess what? They look like geodes. Amazing. Right? See the rings and see the crystallization inside? So, yeah. you know, those of you who are like, oh, show me how it can petrify to quartz. Well, show me how the body makes a friggin' geode, you know? Yeah. So um, I, somebody was on a rant about that yesterday, in fact. And uh, I haven't had a chance to see the rant, so I'm not going to address any specifics. But, <laughs> you know. That's good. You shouldn't. Yeah. So here's, here's another example of uh, this is, an, this is a, a geode that was found in nature. These are petrified brains from a guy named Paolo Gorini. So again, petrified flesh is a, also a fact. There's a guy named um, uh, Girolama Segato, who is the, um, he's an 18th century scientist in Italy who, who he had the secret to petrifying any kind of flesh. Um, you know, these are cross sections of testicles. Here's another testicle, you know. There was a gentleman and, uh, in, and here, in... Here's, a, here's, a, here's another... This is a human kidney bladder. Go ahead. There was a gentleman in South Carolina in the 1800s who was um, petrifying people to stone at cemeteries and burials. Right. And yeah, no, he, there's tons of examples of the petrification, aren't there? I mean, yeah. you know this better than making, I do. <laughs> he was making beautiful statues from people. Um, so it, it makes you rethink. Um, there was a, um, I can't remember if it was Yale or Stanford, um, a university did a study and they x-rayed a bunch of statues from all over the world. Um, it's kind of an obscure study. You can still find a lot of pictures of it. The most famous one is the Buddha statue. That's probably the one that pe people are most familiar with. 
but uh, they found that a lot of statues had had people inside of them. And um, yeah, there's yeah. a famous Buddhist monk that's meditating, and they've X-rayed this thing, and it has a whole skeleton inside and everything, mm -hmm. and it appears to have the organs. And you know, I don't know. I, I wasn't there. I didn't see yeah. it with my own eyes, so it could yeah, be yeah, for it sure. could be a fake, you know. But it's just one of those things that you take as a data point, and and you don't you don't cast out the the baby with the bathwater. So these are these are regular geodes, okay? You're and not sharing your these, screen. Oh, thanks for letting me know. I mean, you are, but it's not. There you go. Perfect. Yep. There we go. Yeah. So those are the, these are regular geodes. These are the gallstones, and then when you start looking at just agate in general, all the different ways in which agate manifests are these portions of of. You know, they could be lymph nodes, they could be testicles, they could be, you know, kidney stones, gallstones, liver, uh, liver stones, uh, you, you know, all of these things. Um, and also, very, very importantly, sap, right? Sap right. grows in, in little beads on the sides of trees that are, you know, sometimes they're perfect spheres. And, um, you know, those, the, the sap is, um, is also going to petrify in the same fashion. So I've, you know, I found examples. This is, look at the size of this. That's here in, here in Javier. And, uh, you know, we, we haven't even really gone into the histology of the mountain, uh, which is what the fourth video of the Unveiling a Titan series is all about, is the histology of yeah. the mountain and all the different ways in which it's not just the eye socket and the ear, which we haven't even mentioned. There's an ear socket as well, or I mean, an ear canal as well. And guess where it is? It's right where the ear should be. <laughs> yeah. You know, like what are the, again, what are the odds? So if we look at, I'll just go through this real quick, you know, here's the eye and then this is called the moose gland and here's the ear. And then you have this big ear and that ear attaches in a quarter moon shape. Right. Right. And, and so if we, if we look at, um, at the anatomy, this is, this is what we're looking at. And, and then, <clears throat> let's see. So this is what an ear canal looks like. And so the ear attachment, if you were to remove this, would you end up with something that looks like that? <laughs> Perhaps. Similar. Yeah. Right. Shape. And guess what? Right there is a cave, the entrance to a cave that it's the most thoroughly excavated cave in all of Europe at the time that they did the excavation. And it is exactly where the, the ear should be. And uh, the whole third video of the Unveiling a Titan series is all about that. And I go into the, the structure of the cochlea and these, these, these hair-like fibers that exist in the cochlea. So here's the cochlea. This is for hearing, the spiral organ that allows us to perceive frequency. These are the, the different bones inside. And then you have the, the ear, ear canal coming in. This is known as the eustachian tube, which is a drainage tube for the for the uh, fluid of the inner ear, and and then this is this is what what I'm looking at, and there are portions of the cave where they've got video footage of the guy going into this portion, and he's going in what appears to be a curving, almost like spiral uh, canal, and and the whole side of the thing, this is the this is the opening from the inside, and and again, like a lot of these caves have these seams in them, just like bodies have with different parts of the body. Right. And here's that section I was talking about in the video where this guy is going around and my God, if that doesn't look like the, like a cochlea, I would so love to get in there <laughs> and check it out. You need climbing gear and ropes. It's at 375 meters altitude. But, um, you know, I mean, again, what are the odds, right? That, that right here where you would expect there to be an ear, uh, there's a canal right there going in. And if you if you look at the Unveiling a Titan series, there's a teaser video that's 90 seconds um, that shows the footage. But in the third video, I, I go into detail about the um, about the the ear of Mont Go. And there's just so many different ways in geology that that things manifest in in ways that just boggle the mind. Like how how do you explain this? This is just that's all different kinds of salt. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Salt mountains. And and is this petrified blood plasma of Titans? Could very well be. 
you know, it's, it's, it's definitely worth uh, contemplating. Then you have the, the, the sarsen stones of, um, of the, the, the circles. You know, they've got these holes going into them that look like blood vessels. Some say they're geopolymers. Mm-hmm. I think um, the, these are, you know, the related. I haven't managed to see the rest of the video um, on the Saxon stones yet from uh, Old World Florida. But uh, several of the stones that he's showing in, in, in Florida are what I would call native limestone. Mm-hmm. You do a whole stream on just limestone alone. Yeah. Um, because the native limestone, the difference between native and geopolymer is that the native is is like bedrock. It's how it's how the stone would be um, if, if you um, you know if you harvested it where it, where it was formed, rather than grinding it up into pieces and then making a polymer out of it. So yeah. that's um, you know that's a very important distinction between there all are the, definitely the geopolymer types. stuff. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah because no a lot doubt. of the limes, a lot of the limestone that we've discussed on Old World Florida has shell and other things mixed into it. Um, the shell and the byproducts of the shell when they're ground up help create a very strong substance. And then there are other forms of limestone, as you stated, which I find tons and tons and tons of correlation with. And you find um, many big statues made from it, um, you know, never quite building size, but it would make a lot of sense um, um, when we're talking about big, big anchors. You wouldn't want to cast the anchor and all those anchors have such a natural formation look to them they look as if they were just yeah. broken off the side of something well but, and those yeah. holes clearly have the rope marks that and the ropes have been there for so long that they've ground the channels yeah and there's no doubt about that yeah but the question is what did they start with oh, have, oh for sure so so they probably started with native limestone that already had holes in a particular point you know so they're starting with, a, in, in my theory, they're starting with a chunk of Titan bone, right? So, so they're different kinds of bone. I can get into yeah. that real, real briefly without going into a lot of detail. But um, so the fourth video of the Unveiling a Titan series is all about the histology of the mountain. So if we look at just a, am I sharing? Wait, let me just change You're it. sharing, but you need to put the screen up. There we go. Mm, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So. This is skull bone, and you've got a sandwich basically between you've got the the periosteum, which is more like skin. Then you have the compact bone, and then you have the spongous bone. Spongous bone looks like Swiss cheese, and that's where our blood is formed in our bodies. It's uh, it's in all of the long bones, the arms, the legs, the skull, the pelvis, and and so you have a thick a thick solid um, portion that grows just like a tree. Like if you if you look at uh, here's here's a better picture. You can see that that um, you have these circular osteons, which are the cells that are that are basically growing bone, and then there's channels going through it, and and so you have blood vessels, <clears throat> and then the blood itself, and the blood plasma is being produced here, and this is where they're harvesting stem cells, right? If they want to do stem cell therapy, they're gonna they're gonna you know um, ret- retrieve stem cells from inside the bone. And then they use those stem cells because they differentiate into other tissues. They use them in other parts of the body to help with healing. So this is what osteons grow like, <laughs> like, yeah. like trees. Absolutely. Okay. And, and so that's great. So this is, this whole intersection is going to look like Swiss cheese, but if you look at it under a microscope, it's going to have the exact same uh, form. So that's fractal in nature. And again, I go in, into a lot of detail in the fourth video, but you can see the sponges bone here. And then this is the compact bone wearing away. This is a hip socket. This is a petrified hip. And then here's another example of what it would what it could look like. So this could just break off and be a chunk. And if you looked at that chunk up close, it would it would uh, you know it would look like limestone with a bunch of holes going through it. For example, this is up on uh, at the foot of Mont Go. So here's here's a bone with no blood. Here's bone with blood. Here's blown, bone with blood with the water removed. And here you can see really what this what we're talking about. So now you've got, yeah, and this, this gets into the histology of bone, which um, I'm not going to go into great detail about. But um, if you look at the mainstream narrative, limestone is sedimentary rock, if you want to believe it, 
composed mainly of skeletal fragments of marine organisms such as coral, forums, and mollusk. So they're literally telling us that limestone is bone, period. <laughs> right? And then they have all these explanations for things like karst, which is how there's all this water erosion that's creating these different channels. And I'm sure that also happens, but it's not going to create erosion like this. Water dissolution and, and, and erosion from water movement is not going to create a channel that creates then smaller channels branching off from that going in different directions. That's not, that's not what's going to happen with a water flow. So when you look in here, you know, if it, this is dark, so you can't see it, but I've got other examples. There will be channels going off to the sides of smaller sizes. You can see it here and here and here. So that to me, the, the whole, oh, and then, and then, you know, you've got the blood plasma, which is red blood cells that have iron, the plasma, which has the fat, which I talked about before. And this is what iron ore looks like. And here's iron ore on limestone. And I've got countless examples of both the cortical portion of the bone, which is the compact. And then also the, the here you can really see these channels going in. It's caked with, with the iron ore, which would be your, your red blood cells because yep. they contain the hemoglobin. And then it's also often caked with the, the, um, the quartz crystal. Here's a real extreme example of what that looks like. This is on top of Mont Go. And you can see these channels. Oh, yeah, very obvious. You know, and so you got to remember what blood vessels look like. And, and I've got these on video. It's not just photos from one angle. I'm going in up close. And here, especially... Look at this. Yeah. Wow. Very Tell me obvious. that doesn't look biological. Here you've got the micro blood vessels. Here you've got larger versions. You've got the iron ore caked throughout. This is a bigger channel and the iron ore is just sticking in there. And when it breaks down, it turns into a red dirt or mud. Yeah. And, and yeah. the entire foothills of Mont Go is surrounded in this. And then you got all kinds of massive chunks of quartz. So these can be bone white or they can be darker. So this is going to be blood plasma mixed with a bit of red blood. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get this brownish, reddish color. Um, and then, I mean, I could just go on and on with example after example. Uh, and on a, But this is native limestone when it's unbroken. Look at it. It's just so obvious that this, that this is not weathering this is not erosion this is this is how this stone grew yeah yeah um, pretty undeniable to me but yeah i mean people will find ways of denying it here's an example of cortical bone which is the the compact thick bone where you're going to have very little in the way of blood vessels but some and and that's going to be your outer portions of your long bones and your and your um you know, your, your skull, your, your uh, pelvis and, and your spine and that sort of thing. So here's another example of that. That's like the size of a car. Right. So that's the histology. Uh, and the, the fourth video uh, goes into a lot more detail about that. And uh, limestone is very, very fascinating. And um, there's a big distinction. There's a big distinction between native limestone and, oh, this is what I was going to show. So, so check this out. Okay. Blood constitution, plasma, and and red blood. Here's your here's your fatty your long chain fatty acids. So if you remove all the water from the blood plasma, what you're left with are are, are basically fat molecules. So if you think of fat molecule, think of egg white. Think of think of salmon. Think of these these nuts. Olive oil. These are all long chain fatty acids. Well, if you take human blood plasma and you remove all the water from it, that's what this is, human serum, and serum albumin, there's, there's your crystalline structure of, of your blood plasma. It's quartz right. crystal. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a stone on the mountain. Okay. And this is bordering on vitrification because this is crystal, but it's not, you know, forming these sharp crystals with... Um, you know, clearly defined lines and a matrix of, of pattern. You've got this smooth, and then look, this is this is 
what human serum albumin looks like under a microscope. When you take this and you look at it under a microscope, you get that. <laughs> yeah, and you're seeing the same thing there, but on a much, much larger scale. Yeah. You don't yeah. need a microscope to see the globules there, do you? That no, must have been you a, don't. A gigantic titan. Yeah. So here you can see that, you know, it's it's just clearly fractal in nature. This is, oh, this is another thing. Where do they find gold? They find it in veins. Where are those veins found? Those veins are found in quartz veins. So gold is found in quartz. And then where are the quartz veins found? They're found in limestone. <laughs> as is crude oil, right? They, they, they're getting crude oil out of limestone layers as well. So crude oil to me is probably your venous blood. So the blood that's not got the, um, the iron in it that I believe, um, and I got that from Roger Spur that that when the when the red when the red blood cells are not present, you don't have the hemoglobin, and then your blood is going to be blue, right? Right. And, and that is is going to petrify to black or or you know darker gray, depending on depending on what you're looking at. Um, so let's see. Um, Maybe we could, you wanted to talk about the trees and, and I, I love the trees. I did two days ago, I did a live stream covering um, the footage of, of uh, another channel, Hangman1128. I think it's, it's one of the absolute most important channels on the internet. Um, he's, he's shown so much incredible information. A lot of people are familiar with this theory that, that a lot of the mesas that we see are tree stumps and, and, then the, that begs the question, like, who cut them down? Because clearly it's not going to erode in this fashion. So someone must have come, come along with a laser to cut it if it was a tree. And then where's the rest of the tree? How did they dispose of that? There's a lot of different theories about um, petrified tree stumps and, and Devil's Tower being one and people looking at the, the, um, the structure of different kinds of plants. And some think it's a mushroom. Some think it's a um, different kinds of I heard somebody say flax, uh, the, the seed of the, 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 the plant that makes fat, flax seeds. And, mm -hmm. But I, I lean towards tree still. I think that's the most likely uh, Occam's razor. But um, the work that, that Hangman has done uh, showing that the great trees existed, and, and we're talking trees that were basically 6, 8, 10 miles in diameter, um, that when you look at the breakdown of a smaller tree, you're seeing all these kinds of patterns. And this is what we're looking at when, when you just look at a chunk of it and you can see how these breaks are vertical. And then you've got all this different kinds of grain and, and this portion here would petrify to coal. The black is going to become coal. And then if it, if it uh, is hit with another heat, uh, enough heat, it will eventually become obsidian. And, you know, when we're seeing these, these different layers of, of sandstone and the different uh, kinds of, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about this because I, I did it for two hours the other day and that I, I would definitely recommend that live stream because it covers a whole bunch of stuff that we haven't talked about at all today. Yeah. But I'm just going to show you some of the magnificent pictures that, that Mike uh, from Hangman1128's channel that, that, he's, that he's done. So this to me is self-evident. This is, this is clearly tree. And we'll, we'll have better pictures in a second with quartz veins going through and it it's fractal. So this, this, uh, you know, this chunk here, you know, this, if you stood by this, maybe you'd come up to here on this one, but this could easily be a hundred foot wide as well or bigger. And, and when you look at how trees break down, it's identical. It's not similar. It is identical. It is the same phenomenon. Here's a photo of him, and he's got many examples of these bigger stones. And here you see the lichen and the moss that's forming. And then you have the erosion. You have the leaching out of the minerals from, from you know, acidic rain and just regular erosion. But here you can still see the color of the wood. You can still see the micro layering of the grain. And um, that it, he's got examples where he's showing portions that are, are stone. And then he finds parts that aren't completely petrified and they're still wood. So it's yeah. 100% 100, 100 proof. 
it is self-evident when you look at it. It's like I said before, the people with the elephant, they're standing and they're pointing and some guy goes, uh, well, show me a DNA analysis, right? And I think you might have shown me this, um, yep. you know, examples of tree stumps with pyramids on top of them. If you don't think that's a tree stump, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Um, you know, oh, it's just a mesa. It just happened that way. Well, here's, yeah, an, exam here's an example of a mesa yeah, with, with growth rings. rings. Great picture. Right? Yeah. Really quick, um, since you brought up that picture mm -hmm. and I had a little presentation ready, um, we're getting low on time. So I'll just run right through it really quick. You can um, go as long as you want, but yeah. But um, I put together a thread a long time ago um, with the picture you showed. Um, this is Cairo. The pyramids of Egypt are built on top of tree stumps. Um, they did an analysis on the plateau that Giza's on, and they said that it had to be cut with a laser because it's so incredibly flat. Well, it just reminds me of the tree stumps we've talked about before, right? And why is that important? Well, um, when you look at the pyramids, um, and there's there's quite a few researchers that have hypothesized this, but this article is fantastic. Um, it's based on an author who wrote a book on the subject, but basically the title of this article is The Great Pyramids of, of Giza or the Real's Noah's Ark. Even the very rooms and tunnels in which the chosen survivors of the deluge took refuge declared by Egyptologists to have been found at last. Um, there's a huge labyrinth under the Giza Plateau. This was well explored and it was more of a public, uh, more public knowledge than it is today. Um, endless and endless tunnels, you know, hundreds of miles of tunnels under the um, under Giza. And part of his analysis was he found um, salt all over the pyramids. And um, but it only went, I believe it was 100 feet from the top. And he said that the pyramids were buried under a salt ocean for several hundred, if not more than a thousand years. And this may seem... Um, a bit outlandish, but when you go through and study many of the Native American cultures, um, Middle America, Canadian, uh, Mesoamerican, South American, in fact, many of their um, stories and legends of some of these ruins that they don't know how were there or that they do have some kind of cultural understanding, they describe them as places of refuge during the flood. Now, Sometimes they would say, like in the Mississippi Delta, they had the same stories. They said that these were built um, for more than one purpose. But one of the main reasons was to survive fl a flood. Now, some may say that's the flooding of the Nile. But others, when you understand that ground level has risen considerably, and many of these pyramids go 50, 20, 100 or more feet under the ground. So when these things were first constructed, ground level was far lower. So to say that it was just the flooding of a river makes no sense, especially when you understand that many of the um, temples on the Yucatan Peninsula, which have no flooding at all, that is a complete limestone formation. There are no rivers. It's all underground streams. The land doesn't flood. It had to have been some kind of tidal wave or serious <clears throat> deluge, perhaps the biblical one that we're discussing. So yeah, these narratives relate to trees. And I believe the subterranean, again, we're connecting a lot of dots here, guys, and due to time, we're not going to be able to go super deep. But I, I've hypothesized that the mining of veins and some of these cave systems, which I've talked a lot about endlessly on many um, episodes, and tomorrow I'll be doing another show and I'll be talking a lot about caves. They strike me as geological formations. Um, often you'll find coal and quartz and limestone and all these things intermingled, the things, same substances we've been discussing. And I think that these pyramids were, think of them like vault doors into the tree and that they were carving massive subterranean homes, cities out of the trees. And they were using the naturally formed veins, as you describe, that form in trees that transport the sap in the water. And using them in tunnels. And obviously, as me and you have talked before, it'd be far easier to shape wood than stone. And a lot mm -hmm. of stone, um, again, I have a bunch of ruin, ruins that they describe as petrified stone, not our petrified tr wood, not stone. So there are petrified homes 
that have been carved from wood that have been turned to stone and they acknowledge this and yeah. i have some pictures here because i went into this in depth uh in the last live stream also talking about the sandstone layers also right. because um they could have been carved into when they were when they were still wood correct but they also could have been carved into when they're sandstone with primitive mm -hmm. tools because sandstone is so soft much easier so than you, wood yeah 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 but then uh, like Paul Cook has found lots of rendering. He's got, you know, pre-rendering and rendering and paint. All those, all these layers. Well, if you were creating a, a sandstone ab abode, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be very comfortable because you're going to have a constant erosion. You're constantly going to be dealing with sand and dust and inhaling that. Yeah, so the plaster they was very they important. Yeah, they would have sealed it to protect, to protect from it. And right. uh, his his work is phenomenal. I I I I think he's finding incredible stuff, and uh, I have you know a lot of praise for him. He's not he's not on board with with these theories about the the trees at all, and and uh, you know maybe I think, maybe at some I think point he'll room, see enough that both. he'll start to open his mind. But yeah, I think it's both. yeah, it's both. He's, there's no doubt that he's finding loads of geopolymer. Also, I agree. yeah, no doubt. Yeah, um, it's a mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then here's another clipping I made. The deluge has been described again by the Ute Indians, the Ute Indians of the Tahoe region, Utah, um, Tahoe, California as well. The Great Spirit sent an immense wave across the continent from the sea, and this wave engulfed both the oppressors and the oppressed, all but a very small remnant. Then the taskmasters. Now, when you look into their mythology, who are the taskmasters? It's a very interesting subject, uh, one that I won't have time to get into. I'll let you make your own conclusions there. The taskmasters made the remaining people raise up a great pyramid so that they of the ruling caste should have a refuge in case of another flood. Um, you kind of see a lot of overlays here when we talk about subterranean worlds. Um, I've mentioned many times in other interviews that the dumbs of military dumbs are corresponding to ancient um, cavernous worlds created by previous civilizations. And you can think of the pyramid as like the old version of the vault. You see the big giant safe doors um, built into the side of the mountain with all the tunnels. And um, they're just kind of reconstituting, reconstructing, um, um, fixing up um, what was already there, perhaps uh, adding on to it. Um, one more I wanted to get to. Um, Real quick while you're looking, um, you know, also going back to geology and mining terminology, they talk about artesian wells. Right. Art is the word. That's the beginning of, of the word artery. So if, if you're talking about uh, water coming up from the waters of the deep, coming through channels, they call that artesian wells. So if you're building on top of a tree stump, why would you do that? Well, it's a solid foundation and it's probably got access to all kinds of permanent water sources if those root structures reached all the way down into the exactly. waters of the deep. Mm -hmm. So you're, it's very, it's going to be very strategic for, you know, and also the tree itself is an endless supply of nutrients so that, you know, if you can find a way of dealing with the lack of light in your underground tunnels, um, you're going to be able to, to grow things forever down there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, this connects with my video I did with Dr. Longo on radium and spring water, how important that is because um you can grow giant everything and anything you can imagine radium exists naturally in trees <coughs> in guess where in sap um they were mining radium oh, from yeah from petrified trees this is public record radium was found in petrified trees so you're filtering the the the, the natural artesian wells that were created by biogeological <laughs> life forms not always but in a lot of cases and you have incredibly clean, pure water that has been impregnated with all kinds of amazing minerals and also radium. And yeah. these things together are going to grow amazing crops. Um, radium also impregnates into crystals and causes them to glow. They will glow. This is bioluminescence. Um, and the picture I wanted to show on that as well. <laughs> bioluminescence yeah. is just uh, yeah. amazing. I know we're touching on a million. Yeah, a million yeah. things. When we do this Sono, again, sonoluminescence, light from we, yeah. sound. When we do this again, we'll we'll kind of do the mystical sci-fi stuff that I didn't get time to talk about. But I show a few mm. pictures here, and I've talked about Avatar in other interviews. Um, I'm going to do a movie review eventually when I have time about that movie and how important it is. But essentially, you had all these cultures in these times of 
of the giant trees and everyone lived around the trees. So part of one of my articles here that unfortunately due to this, the glitchiness of, of Google Chrome wasn't shown, but basically it, it, the article talks about during a hurricane, a farmer in Florida lost a cypress tree and inside the, so cypresses can be hollow. I've talked about this on Old World Florida many times. A cypress can be hollow. In fact, most of them are hollow for a certain extent. Well, the tree, inside the tree was found 50 different animals, all alive. All the animals go inside of the cypresses during storms to survive. Why wouldn't humans do the same thing on a massive scale? Humans were living around trees. Um, we've talked about this before, Mike, me and you, and and uh, 13th Monkey, Mike, is episode one. Um, in the, the rainforest, in these large um, uh, vapor canopy-esque type environments, tropical areas, 90% of all life lives in and around the tree, in, around, and on the tree. This would be no different than the, than the ages we're discussing previously. Um, mankind grew up in and around and on and in, in, inside the tree. It lived on the tree. So the avatar reference is really important because I think this is kind of that uh, Akashic memory, the subconscious mind. Um, these, these things, I believe, are real. And in that movie where the, the invading parasitic race is coming to mine the mineral. And where is the mineral? It's at the base of the tree. Now, Mike, me and you have talked about this before, but many of these ancient giant trees sat on top of giant crystal caves. You actually visited the cave in California that we had discussed before. There, yeah. there was a crystal cave below it that, that they closed, of course. Um, but there's still a crystal cave in one of the, in a, in a California forest that you can still um, go under. I think that was the one you went to, correct? Yeah, Crystal Cave is the name of it. It's in the Sequoias. It's an incredible cave, and it's filled with all these just flowing layers of of marble and limestone and and you know crystalline structures. And that that also ties into um, the uh, you know the work of Hangman One One Two Eight because he he was starting to work on a series where he's showing that the tr the trees are producing all of the different elements. You can find them all in the trees. Yes. And unfortunately he's had a just long string of horrible things happen. His house burned down and, and uh, he just recently lost his father and, and he's just had a heck of a last couple of years. But um, he's, he's shown in my mind unequivocally that, that the trees are producing all of these different elements. You mentioned uh, all the wildlife living in the trees. They tell us that 80% of the wildlife in the in these in the rainforest, the Amazon, uh, you know, are are living in the tree, in or on, you know, like up in the branches, and 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 so that ties into the the petrified organ theory as well, because if the, if there was major electrical storms and plasma involved, which anytime you've got major volcanic activity, you're going to get major plasma and electricity. The, the the photos for that are, you know, the, endless. Plenty of video, endless. Um, so where, where are the first animals and creatures going to get hit with massive amounts of heat and electricity tops of the trees, right? Cause they're Absolutely. closest. So, so then you've got the biblical references of the sky raining body parts, <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. going back to the boiled egg theory hit with massive amounts of, of energy, to the point where it's just like the, the the organs have hardened, the rest of the body is is destroyed, and that all falls to the ground, and you know that that ties in as well. And then um, you mentioned there was one th bit of it that I lost about the the uh, the crystal caves, but maybe it'll come back to me. Um, yeah, just running out of time, so yeah, let's um, just wrap it up. I just want to show a couple more things real quick. Um, if if we've got the chance yeah um, um, people thank you guys again so much for tuning in um it means a lot um in the comments um leave questions and things that you'd like for me and mike to cover in the next episode we do um we'll start with the avatar reference and we'll kind of go from there uh, maybe connecting some dots between you know sci-fi um and these kind of outlandish um mystical um, science fiction concepts and show how they're far more closely related to our realm that we inhabit. But yeah, Mike, go ahead, show, share the last few things you'd like. 
Yeah, and maybe sometimes we could just do a stream where we're we're talking, you know, going through comments from subscribers and and maybe even take calls and. Um, I wanted know, to do that today. Interacting with the chat more. There's always so much to show and so much to cover that I, yeah. I can't keep track of the chat as well. Yeah, we got um, about 10 minutes and then I got to get the kids ready for school. Perfect. So. I just want to show a five. Five will be enough. This is another shot from Hangman. If you can't see this is tree, I don't know what to tell you. I can't yeah. help you because it's so bloody obvious. The sap petrifies to quartz and you can see the grain. You can see the pores of the, of the tree. This is a tiny section of a tiny branch perhaps that would have been you know you know who knows how big but the the tree itself is miles in diameter so how high does a tree like that stretch into the mm -hmm. sky right yeah so uh the the grain everything this is not pareidolia this is not apophenia this is what it is it's self-evident and when you understand this you understand that his channel is the most important channel on youtube in my opinion because it proves unequivocally that the world was once like Avatar. It's not a fantasy. Hollywood is constantly giving us the truth in fiction and hiding the truth. <laughs> you know, so that, so you have to you have to be a selective sifter and 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 really start to use your discernment and and realize that start with the, the empirical world first and look at what you can prove to yourself just by observing. Because this is this is proof. There's Mike's dogs, and I mean, look at how beautiful this this section is. So here you don't see the grain because it's it's starting. You know, it, it cleaves in this line here. This was where one of those little chunks would be, the 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 end of the chunks. And sometimes you can see the micro layers of the grain. Other times it breaks down to to sandstone. Um, and he's come up and he's found sections of this stone which are still wood which haven't entirely petrified. So, you know, that's what you would call a boom. And uh, and it makes a hell of a lot more sense than sedimentary layering and tectonic activity, which is your mainstream explanation for this stuff, which is, you know, it's uh, Jack and Jill went up the hill kind of stuff. It's, it's such a simplistic explanation for what we're seeing in our reality. And then uh, they'll, you know, they make all kinds of claims they point and claim and then they have hundreds of millions of years of timeline and and no ability to actually observe the phenomenon happening you know it's like with the basalt columns and the you know the 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 potentially petrified tree stumps they claim that that is flowing lava that cooled in hexagonal columns pointing upward and i ask you when have you ever seen lava do that anywhere yeah anywhere Name, find me a video where that's happening and I might believe it. But until then, I'm calling bullshit. Um, so just finish with a couple of, uh, of these stones that I was trying to find in the beginning. That's a beautiful one. Um, I've had many people send me examples. This is the back upper side. Guess what? Aorta Vena Cava, right where it should be. Mm -hmm. Here's, here's a, a better view of that one. I showed this one earlier. Back side, front side. Um, and then these other this is the this is the back side of that one with the aorta and the vena cava openings at the top and there's your front side and this quartz is the remainder of the of the pericardium and show that one as well so yeah that's what i was wanting to to get through today <laughs> and we did it despite Amazing. all the technical difficulties in the beginning what a pain in the ass that was but there's always a few but mike yeah. thank you again i really appreciate it um Appreciate you doing this. Thanks um, for the invite. And everybody, if you haven't already subscribed to Ben's channel, do it because it's just going to be one gem after another coming from him. I've been talking to him for four years. Actually, now he's gotten so popular and busy that if I want to have a conversation with him, I have to schedule a dang live stream <laughs> <laughs> because he's got three kids and a job, a full, you know, full-time job. And, um, you know, thankfully you can, do all of this study when you're at, at work uh, because you know it makes you uh, forced to be reckoned with. And um, I praise that your, and your I appreciate, opinion means a lot. As does yours to me. So I, I appreciate the invite. His his channel name is is it still waking up with analog or are you now the archivist? Yeah, you can find it under both. But yeah, and maybe someone in the chat can uh, post a link. Yeah, that'd be great. With analog, I should have one ready, but I don't. You know, I'm still, I'm still.
polishing this whole presentation stuff. So, but I think uh, I, I think in the liner notes of, of my live stream, uh, I put both the link to your Twitter account, which is where you've archived everything and all your articles, and also to the um, to the YouTube channel, which is very new, but it's already got close to two thousand subs, and I imagine it's going to blow up uh, because you've done lots of um, collaborations and interviews with other people over yeah. over the last few years but you've never had a channel of your own and everyone's no. always clamoring where's your channel where's your channel so finally yeah. we've got we've got a place to send people and uh this is it's going to be fun to to see how all this starts to come together more and, and more and more collaborations um that's going and great again so far. And, and again thank you to those of you who who donated um you know this is this is not exactly a money-making venture. It's actually cost me a lot more money than it's earned me in the last four years. So um, every little bit helps, and it goes to things like microscopes and, um, you know, cameras and and whatnot. So um, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, thanks again. I think next episode we'll start with uh, like maybe some some biblical Enoch and some Avatar, and we'll we'll go from there. Okay. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that really, how much scripture of different religions and different mythological texts all, you know, confirms the stuff that we've, we've been talking about here. So there, yeah. it's not just the empirical evidence, it's our historical record. Um, yeah. Yep. Money, money is trivial until you need it, Lenny. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks again, guys. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, appreciate it. Um, and tune in tomorrow. I'm doing another one same time with Paul Cook. Um, yeah, it should don't be great. Miss that. That'll be and, that'll be fire, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll be doing caves and what lies beneath and stuff like that. So and Mike, thank you so much for doing this and everyone tuning in. Thank you. My pleasure. And yeah. Um, Thanks stay for the tuned. Invite. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye, everybody.